All righty, folks. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Hello and welcome to Pick Your Poison Productions' first ever show, my first ever internet live Zoom call show. Uh, my name is Sarah Dernesk. Uh, Ariel Dement, who is in your, oh gosh, top left corner on the screen. That is uh, Gwendolyn Fairfax tonight. Uh, she and I are both the co-producers of tonight's event. Uh, and we are just over the moon to have y'all with us. Um, this has been a, uh, oh gosh, I don't even know how to say it. This has been a really fun project to work on for the last few months. And I am just tickled uh, to death at the wonderful cast we have assembled. Um, I'm so grateful to all of them who agreed to be a part of this. They are all absolutely astonishing. You're just in for the biggest biggest treat tonight. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you for being with us. Um, Ariel, do you have anything you wanna say? Uh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So a couple of notes, technical notes. Obviously this is a Zoom performance. We are doing acting. We are, I promise. There's gonna be some really fun tricks that we have um, lovingly learned and borrowed from uh, performers on Zoom who have come before us. In particular, uh, the show must go online. I wanna give them a shout out. If you're looking for great theater, check them out. They definitely inspired a lot of what's going on tonight. Um, but, uh, but Ariel and I uh, have been working um, together for the last year. We had been wanting to put on a live production in a real theater. And then, you know, that thing happened um, that uh, unfortunately prevented us. And, uh, and so then we were talking all through the beginning of quarantine about how else we could do something. Um, and all the other folks that were putting on online shows just really inspired us. And so we dove in and we asked a bunch of friends and fabulous performers that we knew and they all agreed to do it. Surprisingly. Um, which, yeah, that's the more surprising <laughs> thing. We decided to experiment with us. So here we are. So technical things for tonight, obviously we are on screens um, and technical errors may happen. Should they happen, we just beg that you forgive us. Um, the technique we're gonna utilize tonight uh, to be on screen and off, or rather on stage and off stage is lighting, that's it. Um, we are going to go dark as many of our uh, actors currently are uh, when we are off stage. Uh, and then we will turn the lights back on when we are on stage. Um, and the reason why we're gonna keep all the performers on screen is because you know what's special about tonight, it's a drinking game. And we didn't want anyone to think they were drinking alone. Uh, so we the whole alone. cast, no, 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 no. Never should drink alone. <laughs> um, we will all be uh, on at all times, drinking along with y'all, participating. Although we'll go over some of the rules and some of the other choices you make may make. You don't have to drink. Um, it can be a placeholder and uh, we'll have some folks to explain that to you in just a moment. Uh, also those on a technical note, should we have technical issues, our uh, swing, Anthony, is in a box below. Thank you, Anthony. Should anyone, uh, any one of our uh, internets go out, uh, he will be stepping into whichever role uh, that is needed. So uh, if you happen to see him, Oh, I'm mirrored. So I pointed yeah. the wrong way. Apparently he's that way. <laughs> Interesting. Um, <laughs> technical things. Uh, but yeah, he will swan into our rescue. He has been present for just about every rehearsal and we're very grateful to him. He's had to learn a lot uh, and we appreciate him for it. Uh, so if you hear him suddenly start to speak, it's probably because he's covering for someone else whose technical issues have popped up. Um, I think that's the only other technical note you need to know. Uh, because we cannot do all of the actions on stage, a lot of our stage directions and actions will be narrated by the butlers of the show. If you're at all familiar with Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest, uh, you will know Lane and Merriman. And if you don't, you're going to get to know them and they might be a little different than you've seen before. Um, so I think that's just about it. Uh, we, we want the cast to come off mic real quick though and introduce what they're drinking. I'll go first, I got a Bloody Mary. Tonight, Gwendolyn? I am drinking a lovely new vintage of the McBride Six Sisters. If you haven't checked them out, you should. Oh my gosh, are we advertising, girl? What I am advertising that one because it goes with our cause. On the side. That's it goes right. with our cause, so I'm advertising. But I am drinking a lovely red blend tonight. Uh, and I am drinking a whiskey old-fashioned sweet with maple syrup because I'm a Wisconsin boy. Algernon? I am drinking a uh, bullet rye on the rocks, so I will be sipping, sipping, I think. <laughs> no, no, I won't. Cecily? I am drinking uh, rum and Dr. Pepper, 
so I can hear all of my friends judging me right now, but it's okay. <laughs> I still like it. We love you anyway. Uh, Lady Bracknell. I am drinking a bee's knees, which is a little bit of lemon juice, a little bit of honey syrup, and a lot of bit of gin. <laughs> Canon. I've got a Sierra Nevada pale ale. Excellent. Good choice. Anthony, our cast swing stalwart and true. I will be drinking a very tall gin and tonic. <laughs> very <The> tall. tallest. <laughs> uh, Merriman. Like any good butler, I will be drinking seltzer water. That is also a bit harder than the usual. <laughs> hmm. All right. And then Lane. I am drinking a dry cider called Nevertheless. Oh, I love that name. Nevertheless, uh, persistence, I suppose. Uh, on on, on a, an adjacent note, just before we, we truly get going, I do want to introduce our cause for the evening. When we init uh, initially were, were planning this production, we were going to um, take tips and disperse them amongst the performers, since we are all performers and entertainers who can't work right now. Um, but in the middle of what has uh, more pressingly swept our country right now, uh, we instead have chosen um, to support a cause and that is Broadway for Racial Justice. It is a new initiative fighting for racial justice and equity by providing immediate resources, assistance, and amplification of BIPOC uh, folks in the Broadway and theatrical community at large. Um, in doing so, they are working to help create safe spaces throughout the theater community for creativity and artistry to thrive. Um, so if you're watching tonight, uh, we will just ask that in lieu of any support of us personally, that you will support this cause. Um, which is in turn supporting arts and the artists in it um, as a whole. Um, the website is down below in our comments. And if it's not, I'll make sure it's there once the stream is over. Um, but just in case, it is www.bfrj.org. Um, so you can please visit their website, read up more about uh, them and the work they are doing. Um, and, and please support them um, in any way you can, be that sharing their cause to all of your friends and all of your social medias, or perhaps supporting them financially if you are able. Um, we would very much appreciate that. Without further ado, I think we've said just about all we can say. We are now going to have our stalwart butlers uh, introduce the game of tonight's performance. Good evening, lords, ladies, and gentle them. Tonight's production is, as you know, a rather non-traditional iteration of Oscar Wilde's classic comedy, The Importance of Being Earnest. It's a drinking game for you, the audience, and we, the actors, alike. Now, there are many ways you can choose to participate in this game. We have each chosen a favorite beverage or two, which we will be indulging in on the cue word. You may likewise choose an indulgence of some kind. You might join us in the indulgence of a temperance beverage, a nice mixed cocktail or refreshing wine. Or if you'd rather perhaps a sip of coffee or Red Bull on every cue. If you're feeling peckish, perhaps snack your way through the show instead. Eat a mini muffin or M&M for every iteration. You may choose a punishment rather than an indulgence of your feelings so inclined. Perhaps you're trying to stave off that quarantine 15. Try a favorite workout for every cue. Do a push-up, a jumping jack, or a squat if you're feeling up to the challenge. Whatever activity you choose, be it indulgence or punishment, please know that we recommend moderation at every turn. The game element should only add to your enjoyment, this enjoyment in this experience. Should you reach your limits in safe participation, we hope you will feel free to tap out and sit back to enjoy the rest of the show in relaxation. And to make things easy for those of you participating, we have only one rule. Take a drink whenever you hear the word or name Ernest. Drink. Remembering that take a drink is a placeholder for whatever indulgence or punishment you have selected. The cue is said 86 times over the course of our performance. So again, moderation is key. Should you like to play the game on easy mode, you might choose to cue yourself on variants of the word Bunbury instead. That's only said 56 times. 
all if you want to get really into it and it would not require you to participate beyond your personal limits you could queue on both Ernest and Bunbury whatever queue you choose and however you decide to participate or not within the game we sincerely hope you will enjoy the show and without further ado, pick your poison productions present the importance of being earnest. Drink. Drink. Now we begin in the morning room in Mr. Algernon Moncrief's flat in Half Moon Street. The room is luxuriously and artistically furnished. The sound of a piano is heard in the adjoining room. on the table, rather pedestrianly, I may add. As he finishes, the amateur pianist enters the room. Did you hear what I was playing, Lane? I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. Oh, uh, I am sorry for that, for your sake. <laughs> I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately, but I play with wonderful expression <laughs> as far as the piano is concerned sentiment is my forte i keep science for life yes sir and speaking of the science of life have you got the cucumber sandwiches cut for lady Bracknell? yes sir mm -hmm. oh uh, by the way lane I, I see from your book that on thursday night when lord shoreman and mr worthing were dining with me Eight bottles of champagne are entered as having been consumed. Yes, sir, uh, eight bottles and a pint. Why is it that at a bachelor's establishment, the servants invariably drink the champagne? Uh, I ask merely for information. I attribute it to the superior quality of the wine, sir. I have often observed that in married households, the champagne is rarely of a first-rate brand. Oh, good heavens! Is marriage so demoralizing as all that? I believe it is a very pleasant state, sir. I have had very little experience of it myself up to the present. I have only been married once, and that was in consequence of a misunderstanding between myself and a <clears throat> young person. I don't know that I'm much interested in your family life, Lane. No, sir. It is not a very interesting subject. I never think of it myself. Yeah, very natural, I'm sure. <laughs> that will do, Lane, thank you. Thank you, sir. Falling into deep ruminations on his prior mistakes, Lane goes out. Lane's views on marriage seem somewhat lax, really. <clears throat> if the lower orders don't set us a good example, what on earth is the use of them? They seem as a class to have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. <laughs> Lane, looking vaguely morally bankrupt, enters. Mr. Ernest Worthing. A vastly superior employer, Mr. Worthing enters as an inferior butler departs. Oh, how are you, dear Ernest? What brings you up to town? Oh. Pleasure, pleasure. What else should bring anyone anywhere? Eating as usual, I see, Elsie. I believe it is customary in good society to take some slight refreshment at five o'clock. <laughs> uh, where have you been since Thursday? In the country. Oh, what on earth do you do there? When one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. It is excessively boring. And who are the people you amuse? Who? Oh, neighbours, neighbours. Mm. Got nice neighbours in your part of Shropshire? Perfectly horrid. <laughs> Never speak to one of them. 
how immensely you must amuse them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> By the way, uh, Shropshire is your county, is it not? Yeah, Shropshire, yes, of course. Hello, why all these cups? Why cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in one so young? Who is coming to tea? Oh, uh, merely Aunt Augusta mm. and Gwendolyn. <laughs> are perfectly delightful. Yes, 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 that is all very well, but I'm afraid Aunt Augusta won't quite approve of your being here. May I ask why? My dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. <laughs> it's almost as bad as the way that Gwendolyn flirts with you. I am in love with Gwendolyn. I have come to town expressly to propose to her. I thought you had come up for pleasure. I call that business. <laughs> How utterly unromantic you are. Mm. I really don't see anything romantic in proposing. It, it is very romantic to be in love, but there's nothing romantic about a definite proposal. Uh, why one may be accepted, uh, one usually is, I believe, and then the excitement is all over. Uh, the very essence of romance is uncertainty. If I ever get married, I'll, I'll certainly try to forget the fact. I have no doubt about that, dear Elgie. The divorce court was specially invented for people whose memories are so curiously constituted. Oh, there is no use speculating on that subject. Divorces are made in heaven. Please don't touch the cucumber sandwiches. They are ordered specially for Aunt Augusta. You've been eating them all the time. Oh, that's quite a different matter. She's my aunt. Huh. Oh, have some bread and butter. The bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is devoted to bread and butter. Mm, very good bread and butter it is too. Hmm. Oh. Well, my dear fellow, you, you, you need not eat it as if you're going to eat it all. Uh, you behave as if you're married to her already. You are not married to her already, and I don't think you ever will be. Why on earth do you say that? Well, in the first place, girls never marry the men they flirt with. Uh, girls don't think it right. Oh, that is nonsense. Oh, it isn't. It is a great truth. It accounts for the extraordinary number of bachelors that one sees all over the place. In the second place, I don't give my consent. Your consent? Oh, my dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin. And before I allow you to marry her, you will have to clear up the whole question of Cecily. Cecily? What? Cecily, what on earth do you mean? What do you mean by Cecily, LG? I don't know anyone by the name of Cecily. Wiping the sleep from his eyes, Lane re-enters. Uh, bring me that cigarette case Mr. Worthing left in the smoke smoking room the last time he dined here. Yes, sir. Oh, with a hidden yawn, Lane goes out. <laughs> Do you mean to say that you've had my cigarette case all this time? I wish to goodness you had let me know. I have been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. I was very nearly offering a large reward. Ah, well, I wish you would offer one. <laughs> I happen to be more than usually hard up. Oh, you could offering a large reward now that the thing is found. Now, Lane enters with the pilfered cigarette case. Uh, then this manservant of an obvious thief departs. I think that is rather mean of you, Ernest. I must say. Mm. However, it makes no matter, for now that I look at the inscription inside, I find that the thing isn't yours after all. Of course it's not. You've seen me with it a hundred times, and you have no right whatsoever to read what's written inside. It's a very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. Oh. Uh. It is absurd to have a hard and fast rule about what one should read and what one shouldn't. And more than half of modern culture depends on what one shouldn't read. I'm quite aware of the fact and I don't propose to discuss modern culture. It isn't the sort of thing that one should discuss in private. I simply want my cigarette case back. Uh, yes, yes, yes. But this isn't your cigarette case. This cigarette case is a present from someone of the name of Cecily. And you said you didn't know anyone of that name. Well, if you want to know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt? Yes. Charming old lady she is, too. Lives in Tunbridge Wells. Just give it back to me, Elgie. 
It's, yes, but, but, but why does she call herself Little Cecily if she's your aunt and lives at Tunbridge Wells? Uh, from Little Cecily, with her fondest love. My dear fellow, what on earth is there in that? Some aunts are tall, some aunts are not tall. That is a matter that surely an aunt may be allowed to decide for herself. You seem to think that every aunt should be exactly like your aunt. That's absurd. For heaven's sake, give me back my cigarette case. Yes, it is. But why does your aunt call you her uncle? Hmm? From little Cecily, with her fondest love, uh, to her dear uncle Jack. <laughs> there is no objection, I admit, to an aunt being a small aunt, but why an aunt, no matter what her size might be, should call her own nephew her uncle, I, I can't quite make out. Uh, besides, your name isn't Jack at all. It's Ernest. It isn't Ernest. It's Jack. Mm. You have always told me it was Ernest. Yeah. Mm. I've introduced you to everyone as Ernest. <laughs> you answer to the name of Ernest. Yeah. You look as if your name was Ernest. You, mm. you are the most earnest looking uh -huh. person I ever saw in my life. It's perfectly absurd you're saying that your name isn't Ernest. Uh. Mm. It's on your cards. Look, Don't. here's one of them. Don't. Mr. Ernest Worthing, before the Albany. <clears throat> I'll keep this as proof that your name is Ernest if you ever attempt to deny it to me or to Gwendolyn, Gwendolyn or to anyone else. Uh, well, my name is Ernest in town. Oh, Jack in the country. The cigarette case was given to me in the country. Yes, but that does not account for the fact that your small aunt Cecily, who lives at Tunbridge Wells, calls you her dear uncle. <sighs> Come, old boy. You would much better have the thing out at once. Yeah, Elgie, you talk exactly as if you were a dentist. And it is in entirely vulgar to talk like a dentist when one isn't a dentist. It causes a false impression. <laughs> well, that is exactly what dentists always do. <laughs> okay, now go on, go on, go on, go on. Tell me the whole thing. Uh, I may mention that I have always suspected you of being a confirmed and secret bun breast. <laughs> and I'm quite sure of it now. Bun breast? What on earth do you mean by bun breast? Mm. I reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you're kind enough to inform me why you are earnest in town and Jack in the country. Well... Produce my cigarette case first. Here it is. Now, produce your explanation and pray. Make it improbable. My dear fellow, there's nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it's perfectly ordinary. Old Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy, made me in his will guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily, who addresses me as her uncle from motives of respect that you could not possibly understand, lives at my place in the country under the charge of her admirable governess, Miss Prism. And uh, where is that place in the country, by the way? <laughs> oh, that is nothing to you, dear boy. You are not going to be invited. And I may tell you quite, quite, quite candidly that the place is not in Shropshire. I suspected that, my dear fellow. I have bun bread all over Shropshire on uh, two separate occasions. Now, go on. Why are you Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear Elsie, I don't know whether you could possibly understand my real motives. You are hardly serious enough. When one is placed in position of guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone on all subjects. It is one's duty to do so. And, as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce very much in either one's health or one's happiness, in order to get up to town, I have always pretended to have a younger brother by the name of Ernest. Who lives in Albany and gets in the most dreadful scrapes. That, my dear LG, is the whole truth, pure and simple. Uh, the truth is rarely pure, never simple. 
modern life would be very tedious if it were either, and modern literature a complete impossibility. Oh, that would at all be a bad thing. Uh, literary criticism is not your forte, my dear fellow. Don't try it. Uh, you should leave that to people who haven't been at a university. Hmm. They do it so well in the daily papers. What you really are is a Bunburyist. Hmm. I was quite right in saying that you are Bunburyist. You are one of the most advanced Bunburyists I know. What on earth do you mean? You have invented a very useful younger brother called Ernest. Hmm. In order that you may be able to come up to town as often as you like, I have been invented an invaluable permanent invalid called Bunbury. In order that I may be able to go down into the country whenever I choose. Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. If it wasn't for Bunbury's extraordinary bad health, for instance, uh, I wouldn't be able to dine with you at Willis's tonight, for I've really been engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week. I haven't asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight. I know. You're absurdly careless about sending out invitations. It is very, very foolish of you. Nothing annoys people so much as not receiving invitations. Well, you had better dine with your Aunt Augusta. Uh, I haven't the smallest intention of doing anything of the kind. Uh, to begin with, I dine there on Monday, and once a week is quite enough to dine with one's own relations. In the second place, whenever I do dine there, I, I am always treated as a member of the family and sent down with neither no woman at all or two. In the third place, <laughs> I know perfectly well whom she will place me next to tonight. She will place me next to Mary Farquhar, who always flirts with her own husband across the dinner table. It's not very pleasant. Indeed, it is not even decent. And that sort of thing is enormously on the increase. The amount of women in London who flirt with their own husbands is perfectly scandalous. It looks so bad. It is simply washing one's clean linen in public. Besides, now that I know you to be a confirmed Bunburyist, I naturally want to talk to you about Bunburying. I want to tell you the rules. Not a Bunburyist at all. If Gwendolyn accepts me, I'm going to kill my brother. Oh. Indeed, I think I'll kill him in any case. Cecily is a little too much interested in him. He's rather a bore. So I'm going to get rid of Ernest. And I strongly advise you to do the same with the Mr. Your invalid friend with the absurd name. Nothing will induce me to part with Bunbury. Mm. And if you ever get married, which seems to me extremely problematic, you'll be very glad to know Bunbury. A man who marries without knowing Bunbury has a very tedious time. It is nonsense. If I marry a charming girl like Gwendolyn, and she's the only girl I have ever saw in my life I would marry, I certainly won't want to know Bunbury. <laughs> then your wife will. <laughs> you don't seem to realize that in married life, three is company and two is none. That my dear young friend, is the theory that the, foreign, that, that the French drama has been propounding for the last 50 years. Yes, and that the happy English home is proved in half the time. For heaven's sake, don't try to be cynical. It's perfectly easy to be cynical. Oh, my dear fellow, it isn't easy to be anything nowadays. There's such a lot of beastly competition about. The sound of an electric bell is heard. <laughs> Ah, that must be Aunt Augusta. <laughs> Only relatives or creditors ever ring in that Wagnerian manner. Now, if I get her out of the way for 10 minutes so that you can have an opportunity for proposing to Gwendolyn, may I dine with you tonight at Willis's? Oh, I suppose so, if you want to. Yes, but you must be serious about it. I hate people who are not serious about meals. It's so shallow of them. Pondering his prospects as a singer, Lane enters. I'm your boy. Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. <laughs> an ornate chandelier of a woman and her daughter, uh, more of an aspiring candelabra, arrive together. My dear lady. Good afternoon, dear Algernon. I hope you are behaving very well. 
Well, I'm feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. Mm, that's not quite the same thing. In fact, the two things rarely go together. Oh, dear me, you are smart. I am always smart. Am I not, Mr. Worthing? You are quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. <laughs> oh, I hope I am not that. It would leave no room for developments, and I intend to develop in many directions. Miss Fairfax's first direction of choice seems to be a dark, remote corner with Mr. Worthing. Oh. I'm sorry if we are a little late, Algernon, but I was obliged to call on dear Lady Harbury. I hadn't been there since her poor husband's death. I never saw a woman quite so altered. She looks quite 20 years younger. And now I have a cup of tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Certainly, Aunt Augusta. Won't you come and sit here, Gwendolyn? Thanks, Mama. I am quite comfortable where I am. Good heavens! Lane! Why are there no cucumber sandwiches? I ordered them specially. There were no cucumbers in the market this morning, sir. I went down twice. No cucumbers? No, sir. Not even for ready money. That will do, Elaine. Thank you. Thank you, sir. With an empty stomach and a mouth full of lies, as usual, I might add, Lane retreats. I am greatly distressed, Aunt Augusta, about there being no cucumbers. Not even for ready money. It really makes no matter, Algernon. I had some crumpets with Lady Harbury, who seems to me to be living entirely for pleasure now. Oh, I hear her hair has turned quite gold from grief. It certainly has changed its color. From what cause, I, of course, cannot say. Thank you. I've quite a treat for you tonight, Algernon. I am going to send you down with Mary Farquhar. She's such a nice woman and so attentive to her husband. It is delightful to watch them. I'm afraid, Aunt Augusta. I shall have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight after all. I hope not, Algernon. It would put my table completely out. Your uncle would have to dine upstairs. Fortunately, he is accustomed to that. It is a great bore, and I need hardly say a terrible disappointment to me, but the fact is, I've just had a telegram to say that my poor friend Bunbury is very ill again. They seem to think I should be with him. It is very strange. This Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Yes, poor Bunbury is a dreadful invalid. Well, I must say, Algernon, that I think it is high time that Mr. Bunbury made up his mind whether he was going to live or to die. This shilly-shallying with the question is absurd, nor do I in any way approve of the modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it morbid. Illness of any kind is hardly a thing to be encouraged in others. Health is the primary duty of life. I am always telling that to your poor uncle, but he never seems to take much notice, as far as any improvement in his ailment goes. I should be much obliged if you would ask Mr. Bunbury from me to be kind enough not to have a relapse on Saturday, for I rely on you to arrange my music for me. It is my last reception and one wants something that will encourage conversation, particularly at the end of the season when everyone has practically said whatever they had to say, which in most cases was probably not much. I'll speak to Bunbury, Aunt Augusta, if he is still conscious, and I think I can promise you he'll be all right by Saturday. Of course! The music is a great difficulty. You see, if one plays good music, people don't listen. And if one plays bad music, people don't talk. But I'll run over the program I've drawn out. If you will kindly come into the next room for a moment. Thank you, Algernon. It is very thoughtful of you. I'm sure the program will be delightful. After a few expurgations, French songs I cannot possibly allow. People always seem to think that they are improper and either look shocked, which is vulgar, or laugh, which is worse. But German seems a thoroughly respectable language and indeed, I believe it so. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me? Certainly, Mama. Lady Bracknell and Mr. Moncrief go into the music room, but Miss Fairfax remains rather naughtily behind. Charming day it has been, Miss Fairfax. 
Pray do not talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain that they mean something else. <laughs> and that makes me so nervous. Well, I do mean something else. Oh, I thought so. In fact, I am never wrong. And I would like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. Oh, I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has a way of coming back suddenly into a room that I have often had to speak to her about. <laughs> um, Miss Fairfax, ever since I have met you, I have admired you more than any other girl that I have ever met since I met you. <laughs> yes, I am quite well aware of the fact. And I often wish that in public, at any rate, you had been more demonstrative. For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. <sighs> we live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. The fact is constantly mentioned in the more month expensive monthly magazines and has reached the provincial pulpits, I am told. And my ideal has always been to love someone of the name of Ernest. <laughs> There is something that inspires absolute confidence. The moment Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Gwendolen? Oh, passionately. Oh, darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. Oh, my own Ernest. <laughs> oh, oh. But, uh... <laughs> You don't really mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest, <laughs> right? But your name is Ernest. Oh, right. Oh. I know it is, um, but supposing, hypothetically, uh, that it was something else. Uh, do you mean to say you couldn't love me then? Ah, uh, that is clearly a metaphysical speculation, and like most metaphysical speculation, has very little reference on the actual facts of real life as we know them. Well, personally, darling, uh, just be quite candidly, uh, I don't much care for the name of Ernest. I don't think it much suits me at all. Oh, it suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has music of its own. It produces... Vibrations. Oh, really? <coughs> <Great. clears throat> I must say that I think there are lots of other much nicer names. I think Jack, for instance, charming name. Jack. <laughs> no, there is very little music in the name Jack, if any at all. Indeed, it does not thrill. It produces absolutely no vibrations. I have known several Jacks, and they are all, without exception, more than unusually plain. Okay. Besides, Jack is a notorious demonstricity for John, and I pity any woman who was married to a man called John. She would probably never be allowed to know the entrancing pleasure of a single moment's solitude. The only really safe name is Ernest. <clears throat> Gwendol Gwendolyn, <clears throat> I must get christened at once. I mean, we must get married at once. There's no time to be lost. Married, Mr. Worthing? Well, surely. You know that I love you, and you have led me to believe, Miss Fairfax, that you are not absolutely indifferent to me. I adore you. <laughs> But you have not proposed to me yet. Nothing has been said at all about marriage. The subject hasn't even been touched on. Well, may I propose to you now? I think it would be an admirable opportunity. <laughs> I don't spare you any possible disappointment, Mr. Worthing. I think it only fair to tell you quite frankly beforehand that I am fully determined to accept you. Oh, Gwendolen. Yes, Mr. Worthing, what have you to say to me? Do you know what I have to say to you? Yes, but you do not say it. Oh, um, sorry, um, Gwendolyn, 
Will you marry me? Oh, of course I will, darling. How long you have been about it. I'm afraid you have had very little experience in how to propose. <laughs> My own one, I have never loved anyone in the world but you. I, yes, but men often propose for practice. I know my brother Gerald does. All his girlfriends tell me so. Oh, what wonderful blue eyes you have, Ernest. Yeah, they're, they're green, but... They are quite, quite blue. I hope you will always look at me just like that. Especially when there are other people present. <laughs> As the love swells between them, Lady Brackdale re-enters the room, finding Miss Fairfax and Mr. Worthy in a most compromising position! Mr. Worthy, rise, <laughs> sir, from this semi-recumbent posture. It is most indecorous. Uh... Here you are. Mama, I must beg you to retire. This is no place for you. Besides, Mr. Worthing is not quite finished yet. Finished what, may I ask? <clears throat> I am engaged to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Pardon me, you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged to someone, I, or your father, should his health permit him, will inform you of the fact. An engagement should come on a young girl as a surprise, pleasant or unpleasant as the case may be. It is hardly a matter that she could be allowed to arrange for herself. And now I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Worthing. <clears throat> While I am making these inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, will wait for me below in the carriage. Mama! In the carriage, Gwendolyn. <sighs> Gwendolyn, the carriage! Yes, Mama. With her dreams momentarily dashed, Miss Fairfax departs. You can take a seat, Mr. Worthing. I seem to have no choice. <clears throat> I feel bound to tell you that you are not down in my list of eligible young men. Although I have the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton. We work together, in fact. However, I am quite ready to enter your name should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Well, yes, I must admit I smoke. I'm glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? Uh, 29. Hmm. A very good age to be married at. I have always been of the opinion that a man who desires to get married should know either everything or nothing. Which do you know? <clears throat> um, I know nothing, Lady Bracknell. I am pleased to hear it. I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. <laughs> ignorance is like a delicate exotic fruit. Touch it and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England, at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes and probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. What is your income? Uh, between seven and eight thousand a year. In land or in investments? Investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. What between the duties expected of one during one's lifetime and the duties expected exacted from one after one's death, land has ceased to either be a profit or a pleasure. Mm -hmm. It gives one position and prevents one from keeping it up. That's all that can be said about that. Well, I, I have a country house with some land, of course, attached to it, about 1,500 acres, I believe. But I don't depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only ones that make anything out of it. <laughs> yeah. A country house. Mm -hmm. How many bedrooms? Well, that point can be cleared up afterwards. You do have a townhouse, I hope. 
A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to reside in the country. Well, I own a house in Belgrave Square, but it is let out by the year to a, a Lady Bloxham. Of course, I can get it back whenever I like. <laughs> At six months' notice. Lady Bloxham. I don't know her. Oh, she goes out very little. She is a lady considerably advanced in here. Ah. Uh, nowadays, there is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number in Belgrave Square? Uh, 149. The unfashionable side. I thought there was something. However, that could be easily altered. Do you mean fashion of the side? Both, if necessary, I presume. What are your politics? Well, I'm afraid I really have them. I'm a liberal unionist. Oh, they count as Tories. They dine with us. Or come in the evening at any rate. <sighs> now to minor matters. Are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in what the radical papers called the purple of commerce, or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? Oh, I'm afraid I really don't know. <laughs> the fact is, Lady Bracknell, I said that I lost my parents. It would be near the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was, well, I was found. Found? Yes, the late Mr. Thomas Cardew, an old gentleman of a very charitable and kindly disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. Worthing is a place in Sussex, it is a seaside resort. <laughs> Where did the charitable gentleman who had a first-class ticket to the seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I was in a handbag, somewhat large, black leather handbag with handles to it. An ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. James or Thomas Cardew come across this ordinary handbag? in a cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes. Uh, the Brighton line. The line is immaterial. Mr. Worthing, I confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you've just told me. To be born, or at any rate, bred in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to? As for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion has probably indeed been used for that purpose before now, but it could hardly be regarded as an assured basis for a recognized position in good society. May I ask you then what you advise me to do? I need hardly say that I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthing, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible, and to make a definite effort to produce at any rate one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. But I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment. It is in the dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. <laughs> me, sir? What has it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloak room and form an alliance with a parcel. Good morning, Mr. Worthing. Good morning. Oh, looking most affronted, Lady Bracknell sweeps out in majestic indignation as a subpar pianist fingers his keys. For sake, don't play that ghastly tune, Elgie. How idiotic are you? Oh, didn't it go off all right, old boy? You don't mean to say Gwendolyn refused you? I know it is a way she has. 
She's always refusing people. I think it is most ill-natured of her. Oh, Gwendolyn is right as a trivet. As far as she is concerned, we are engaged. Her mother is perfectly unbearable. I've never met such a gorgon. I don't really know what a gorgon is like, but I am quite sure that Lady Bracknell is one. In any case, she is a monster without being myth, which is rather unfair. I beg your pardon, Nilty. I suppose I shouldn't talk about your own aunt in that way before you. My dear boy, <laughs> I love hearing my relations abused. Mm, it is the only thing that makes me put up with them at all. Relations are simply a tedious pack of people who haven't got the remotest knowledge of how to live, nor the smallest instinct about when to die. Oh, that is nonsense. It isn't. Well, I won't argue the matter. You always want to argue about things. That is exactly what things were originally made for. Upon my word, if I thought that, I'd shoot myself. You don't think that there's any chance of Gwendolyn becoming like her mother in about 150 years, do you, LG? Mm. All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. Uh. No man does. That is his. Is that clever? It's oh, perfectly phrased. And quite as true as any observation in civilized life should be. And seek to death of cleverness. Everybody is clever nowadays. You can't go anywhere without meeting clever people. The thing has become an absolute public nuisance. I wish to goodness we had a few fools left. We have. Oh, I should extremely like to meet them. What do they talk about? Uh, the fools. <laughs> about the clever people, of course. Oh, what fools. Uh, by the way, uh, did you tell Gwendolyn the truth about your being Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear fellow. Mm. The truth isn't quite the sort of thing one tells to a nice, sweet, refined girl. <laughs> What extraordinary ideas you have about the way to behave to a woman. <laughs> the only way to behave to a woman is to make love to her. <laughs> if she is pretty, and to someone else if she is not. <laughs> it's gross and nonsense. Uh, hmm. hey, whoa, 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 what about your brother? Or what about the profligate Ernest? Yeah. Well... Before the end of the week, I shall have got rid of him. They'll say he died in Paris of apoplexy. Lots of people die of apoplexy quite suddenly, don't they? Yes, yes, but, but it's hereditary, my dear fellow. Mm. It's the sort of thing that runs in families. You would much better say a uh, severe chill. Are you quite sure that severe chill isn't hereditary or anything of the kind? Yeah, of course it isn't. Very well, then. My poor brother, Ernest. Poor one out. To be carried off suddenly in Paris by a severe chill. Mm -hmm. That gets rid of him. Yeah, but I thought you said that uh, Miss Cardew was a little too much interested in your poor brother, Ernest. Uh, won't she feel his loss a good deal? Mm. Ah, but it's all right. Cecily is not a silly romantic girl. I'm glad to say she has got a capital appetite, goes long walks, and pays no attention at all to her lessons. I would rather like to see Cecily. I will take very good care that you never do. <laughs> she is excessively pretty, and she is only just 18. Have you told Gwendolyn yet that you have an excessively pretty ward who is only just 18? <laughs> One doesn't blurt these things out to people. Cecily and, Cecily and Gwendolyn are perfectly certain to be extremely great friends. I'll bet you anything you like that half an hour after they have met, they will be calling each other sister. Mm, women only do that after they've called each other a lot of other things first. Mm. And now, my dear boy, if, if we want to get a good table at Willis's, we really must go and dress. Do you know it is nearly seven? No, oh, it is always nearly seven. Well, I'm hungry! Well, I've never known when you weren't. Mm. Oh, but what shall we do after dinner? <gasps> Go to a theatre. No, oh, no. I loathe listening. Mm. Oh, well, let us go to the club. <sighs> no, I hate talking. Well, maybe we can trot round to the Empire by ten? Oh, no. I loathe looking at things. 
It's so silly. Well, what shall we do? Nothing. It's awfully hard work doing nothing. Mm. However, I don't mind hard work where there is no definite object of any kind. <laughs> Looking rather flushed and lame. Oh, Miss Fairfax. Oh, looking either alarmed or aroused, Miss Fairfax rushes in, pushing Lane out. Gwendolyn, upon my word. Algy, kindly turn your back. I have something very particular to say to Mr. Worthing. Really, Gwendolyn, I, I, I don't think I can allow this at all. Algy, you have always adopted a strictly immoral attitude towards life. You are not quite old enough to do that. <laughs> Thank you. My own darling. Oh, Ernest. <gasps> we may never be married. From the expression on Mama's face, I fear we never shall. Few parents nowadays pay any regard to what their children have to say to them. The old fashioned respect for the young is fast dying out. Whatever influence I had over Mama, I lost at the age of three. But although she may prevent us from becoming man and wife, and I may marry someone else, and marry often. Nothing she can possibly do can alter my eternal devotion to you. Oh, dear Gwendolyn. The story of your romantic origin, as related to me by Mama, with unpleasing comments, has naturally stirred the deeper fibres of my nature. Mm. Your Christian name has an irresistible fascination. The simplicity of your character makes you exquisitely incomprehensible to me. Uh, your town address at the Albany, I have. Uh, what is your address in the country? Uh, the manor house. Walton, Hertfordshire. There is good postal service, I suppose. It may be necessary to do something drastic. Of course, consider, of course, serious consideration. I will con communicate with you daily. My own one. How long will you remain in town? Till Monday. Good. Algy, you may turn around now. Thanks. I've turned around already. You may also ring the bell. Ring the bell, Merriman. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Why do you always do this to me, ladies? I've never even my house. You will let me see you to your carriage, my own darling. Oh, certainly. Having neglected on multiple occasions, let me tell you, his duty is to ring the bell, Lane enters. I will see Miss Fairfax out. Yes, sir. Perspiring with passion, Mr. Worthing and Miss Fairfax depart. Tomorrow, Lane, I'm going bunburying. Yes, sir. Uh, I shall probably not be back till Monday. Oh, you can put up my dress clothes, my smoking jackets, and all the bunbury suits. Yes, sir. Oh, I hope tomorrow will be a fine day, Lane. It never is, sir. Lane, you're a perfect pessimist. I do my best to give satisfaction, sir. Oh, really? Well, past experiences to the contrary. Lane leaves, a, a properly satisfying and satisfied man, my master, Mr. Worthing, re-enters. There is a sensible intellectual girl, the only girl I've ever cared for in my life. <laughs> <laughs> what on earth are you so amused at? Uh, I'm a little anxious about Paul Bunbury, that's all. If you don't take care, your friend Bunbury will get you into a serious scrape someday. I love scrapes. They're the only things that are never serious. Oh, that is nonsense, Elgy. You never talk anything but nonsense. Hmm. Nobody ever does. As Mr. Worthing casts an indignant look upon the roguish ne'er-dwell Mr. Moncrief, a curtain drops and lights come up, metaphorically speaking, that is, end of Act One! <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us for Act One. We will resume in five minutes, I will say just five after the arrow hour. In the meantime, we do have for your interlude uh, a little cocktail mixing from a friend of ours. Uh, so cast, please remember to mute. 
Uh, and those of you watching at home, uh, please enjoy a little cocktail mixing. I'm sorry about that folks, technical difficulties. I just realized the sound is not coming through for y'all. Like we said, please forgive us. Try and again. Hello there, Ryan Adam Wells here from Comics and Cocktail Books. I'm here to help you guys out if you're in a mission with a cocktail. I apologize for the way that I look. I have the coronavirus, and I feel like garbage. But let me tell you, I was thinking, what are the things that help us feel better when we're, when we're feeling kind of under the weather, but we still want to party and hang out? What do we do? We do picklebacks. So what I have done is I've created a pickleback old-fashioned. I'm going to show you guys how to make it today. Step one, get a bourbon that you really enjoy. I, I'm a huge fan of Old Uncle. We're going to start with two ounces of whatever bourbon you want to use. Two ounces of old apple, special reserve bourbon. Now, the other two ingredients in an old fashioned are your bitters and your simple syrup. We're going to start with bitters. I've got Marie Laveau's tobacco bitters. Um, it works very nicely with pickle flavors, so grab a tobacco bitters if you can. It's very simple to make your own tobacco bitters too, and there's tons of recipes all over the internet for it, but Marie Laveau's is available readily, so order you something delicious. I'm going to do two liberal dashes, and I've created a dill pickle simple syrup. The way you want to make this is uh, equal parts white sugar and dill pickle juice. Literally just pour it straight out of the can of pickles into the burner on top of the stove. Bring it to a boil, stir until the sugar dissolves. I also cut up two full pickles and threw it into the pot as well. Now let it simmer. Bring it to a boil and let it simmer for about 10 minutes. Take it off, cool it down. Stain it out, and you have dill pickle simple syrup. We want to do a, a far spoon of this. Yeah. I've got these artisan spicy maple bourbon pickles as well, and I'm going to include just a small spoon of the actual pork juice from this. got a nice kick to it, and the maple blends with the bourbon really, really nice. Now, throw some ice into your stirring glass. Give that a nice stir until the glass is cold to the touch. And you see that I'm already breaking a sweat? Try not to hallucinate. Once you've stirred long enough to have and make it through an existential crisis, serve it on top of a large format ice sphere. Like any good old fashioned. <coughs> and we are gonna garnish with one of these.
there you have it, folks. The dill pickle old fashioned. What am I doing? I can't drink this. Who wants the dill pickle old fashioned? watching. All righty. Well, thank you very much to uh, Ryan for uh, mixing us up a fresh cocktail, even in a hard time. We super duper appreciate him. And hey, maybe uh, even if you weren't making it along with him for uh, for this next uh, act, you know, get all that ready. And for the next intermission, start mixing yourself up a pickleback. All right, we'll get started in just a second. Make sure everyone else is ready. Put my headphones back in. Well, let's settle in for act two, shall we? We open on a garden at the manor house. A flight of grey stone steps leads up to the house. The garden, an old fashioned one, full of roses. Time of year, July. Basket chairs and a table covered with books are set under a large yew tree. A fussy, overbearing tutor is seated at the table while her pretty yet provincial student is at the back watering flowers. Cecily, Cecily, uh, surely such a utilitarian occupation as the watering of flowers is, is rather Moulton's duty than yours, especially at a moment when intellectual pleasures await you. Uh, your German grammar is on the table. Pray open it at page 15. We'll repeat yesterday's lesson. I don't like German. It isn't at all a becoming language. I know perfectly well that I look quite plain after my German lesson. Child, you know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. He laid particular stress on your German as he was leaving for town yesterday. Uh, indeed, he always lays stress on your German when he is leaving for town. Dear Uncle Jack is so very serious. Sometimes he is so serious that I think he cannot be quite well. <laughs> Your guardian enjoys the best of health, and his gravity of demeanor is especially to be commended in one so uh, comparatively young as he is. I know of no one who has a higher sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that is why he so often looks a little bored when we three are together. Child, I am surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. Idle merriment and triviality would be out of place in his conversation. You must remember his constant anxiety about that unfortunate young man, his brother. I wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometimes. We might have a good influence over him, Miss Prism. I'm sure you certainly would. You know, German and geology and things of that kind influence a man very much. I do not think that even I could produce any effect on a character that, according to his own brother's admission, is irretrievably weak and vacillating, and indeed I am not sure I would desire to reclaim him. I am not in favor of this of modern mania of turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. As a man sows, so let him reap. Now you must put away your diary, Cecily. I don't really see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary that we all carry about with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles the things that have never happened and couldn't possibly have happened. I believe that memory is responsible for nearly all the three volume novels that Muddy sends us. <gasps> Do not speak slightingly of the three volume novel, Cecily. I wrote one myself in my earlier days. <laughs> Really, Miss Prism, how wonderfully clever you are. I hope it did not end happily. I don't like novels that end happily. They depress me so much. Well, the good ended happily and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose so, but it seems very unfair. 
And was your novel ever published? Alas, no. The manuscript was unfortunately abandoned. Oh? I use the word in the sense of lost or mislaid. But to your work, child, these speculations are profitless. But I see dear Dr. Chasuble coming up through the garden. Oh, Dr. Chasuble, well, this is indeed a pleasure. Enter the Reverend Dr. Canon Chasuble, advancing with great gusto upon sighting Miss Prism. And how are we this morning, Miss Prism? You are, I trust, well. Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I think it would do her so much good to have a short stroll with you in the park, Dr. Chasuble. Uh, Cecily, I have not mentioned anything about, about a headache. No, dear Miss Prism, I knew that, but I felt instinctively that you had a headache. Indeed, I was thinking about that and not about my German lesson when the rector came in. I hope, Cecily, you are not inattentive. Oh, I'm afraid I am. That is strange. Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon her lips. I spoke metaphorically. Uh, my metaphor was drawn from bees. Uh, well, I, uh, I suppose Mr. Worthing has not returned from town yet. Uh, no, we do not expect him till Monday afternoon. Ah, uh, yes. He usually likes to spend his Sundays in London. He is not one of those whose sole aim is enjoyment, as by all account, that unfortunate young man his brother seems to be. But I must not disturb Egeria and her pupil any longer. Egeria? My name is Letitia, Doctor. A, a classical illusion, merely drawn from the pagan authors. Uh, I shall no doubt see you at Evensong. I, I think, I think, dear Doctor, that, uh, that I will have a stroll with you. I find I have a headache after all, and, and a walk might do it good. With pleasure, Miss Prism, with pleasure. Uh, we might go as far as the schools and back. Oh, that would be delightful. Uh, uh, Cecily, you will read your political economy in my absence. The chapter on the fall of the rupee you may omit. It is somewhat too sensational. Even these metallic problems have their melodramatic side. <laughs> Dr. Chasuble and Miss Prism hurry down through the garden with jaunty steps and sweaty palms. Horrid political economy, horrid geography, horrid, horrid German. Merriman enters with a tarnished salver held aloft by his shaky limbs. Mr. Ernest! <laughs> Worthing has just driven over from the station. He has brought his luggage with him. Mr. Ernest Worthing, B4, the Albany W, Uncle Jack's brother. Did you tell him Mr. Worthing was in town? Yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. I told him that you and Miss Prism were here in the garden. He seemed very anxious to speak with you privately for a moment. Mr. Ernest Worthing to come here. Mm. I suppose you had better talk to the housekeeper about a room for him. Yes, miss. Merriman goes off, looking in desperate need of a nap. I have never met any really wicked person before. I feel rather frightened. I am so afraid he will look just like everyone else. Enter Mr. Moncrief. He does. You are my little cousin Cecily, I am sure. You are under some strange mistake. I am not little. In fact, I believe I am more than usually tall for my age. <laughs> but I am your cousin Cecily. You, I see from your card, are Uncle Jack's brother, my cousin Ernest. My wicked cousin Ernest. Oh. <clears throat> I'm not really wicked at all. Cousin Sashley, you mustn't think I am wicked. If you are not, then you have certainly been deceiving us all in a very inexcusable manner. I hope you have not been leading a double life, pretending to be wicked and being very good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. <laughs> oh, well, of course, I, I have been rather reckless. I am glad to hear it. In fact, uh, now that you mention the subject, I, I have been very bad in my own small way. 
don't think you should be so proud of that, though I'm sure it must have been very pleasant. It is much pleasant, to being here with you. I can't understand how you were here at all. Uncle Jack will be back till Monday afternoon. Oh, that is a great disappointment. I'm obliged to go up by the first train on Monday morning. I have a business appointment that I'm anxious to miss. Couldn't you miss it anywhere but in London? No, no, the appointment is in London. Well, I know, of course, how important it is not to keep a business engagement if one wants to retain any sense of the beauty of life. But still, I think you had better wait till Uncle Jack arrives. I know he wants to speak to you about your immigrating. About my what? Your immigrating. He has gone up to buy your outfit. Uh, I certainly wouldn't let Jack buy my outfit. <laughs> He has no taste in neckties at all. I don't think you will require neckties. Uncle Jake is sending you to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. Well, he said at dinner on Wednesday night that you would have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. Oh, well, the accounts I have heard of Australia and the next world are not particularly encouraging. Uh, this world is good enough for me, Cousin Cecily. Yes, but are you good enough for it? I'm afraid I'm not that. That is why I want you to reform me. You might make that your mission, if you don't mind, Cousin Cecily. I'm afraid I've no time this afternoon. Yeah. Well, would you mind my reforming myself this afternoon? It is rather quixotic of you. I think you should try. I will. Mm, I feel better already. <laughs> you are looking a little worse. That is because I am hungry. How thoughtless of me. I should have remembered that when one is going to lead an entirely new life, one requires regular and wholesome meals. Mm. Won't you come in? Uh, thank you. Uh, might I have a buttonhole first? Uh, I never have any appetite unless I have a buttonhole first. Marshal Miel? Uh, no, I'd sooner a, a pink rose. Why? Because you are like a pink rose, Cousin Cecily. I don't think it can be quite right for you to talk to me like that. Miss Prism never says such things to me. Then Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. You are the prettiest girl I ever saw. Miss Prism says that all good looks are a snare. Mm, they are a snare that every sensible man would love to be caught in. No, I don't think I would care to catch a sensible man. I shouldn't know what to talk to him about. Mr. Moncrief and Miss Cardew giddily pass into the house as Miss Prism and Dr. Chasuble return, looking rather flushed and out of breath from all their... walking. You are too much alone, dear Dr. Chasuble. You should get married. A misanthrope I can understand, a womanthrope never. Oh, believe me, I do not deserve so neologistic a phrase. The precept as well as the practice of the primitive church was distinctly against matrimony. Well, that is obviously the reason why the primitive church has not lasted up to the present day. And you do not seem to realize, dear doctor, that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself into a a permanent public temptation. By this very celibacy, uh, a man can, leads weaker vessels astray. But is a man not equally attractive when married? Oh, no man is ever attractive except to his wife. And often, I've been told, not even to her. Hmm. That depends on the intellectual sympathies of the woman. Maturity can be depended on. Ripeness can be trusted. Young women are green. I spoke horticulturally, of, of course. My metaphor was drawn from uh, fruits. Uh, but where is Cecily? Uh, perhaps she followed us to the schools. The homely Mr. Worthing arrives slowly from the back of the garden. Most attractive Mr. Worthing is enrobed in the finest and deepest morning garb. Mr. Worthing? Mr. Worthing? Uh, we did not expect you till Monday afternoon. This is indeed a surprise. And you're so quiet. I know, it's because I'm so sad. Oh. I have returned sooner than I expected. 
Dr. Chasuble, I hope you are doing well. Dear Mr. Worthing, I trust this garb of woe does not betoken some terrible calamity. My brother. More shameful debts and extravagance? Still leading his life of pleasure? Dead. Your brother Ernest? Quite dead? Oh. Well, I, this is quite a lesson for him. I trust he will profit by it. Mr. Worthing, I offer you my sincere condolences. You have at least the consolation of knowing that you were always the most generous and forgiving of brothers. Poor Ernest. He had many faults, but it is a sad, sad blow. Very sad indeed. Were you with him at the end? No. He died abroad in Paris, in fact. I had a telegram last night from a manager of a Grand Hotel. Was the cause of death mentioned? A severe chill, it seems. As a man sows, so let him reap. Charity, dear Miss Prism, charity. None of us are perfect. I myself am peculiarly susceptible to drafts. Will the internment take place here? No, uh, seems he uh, has expressed a desire to be buried in Paris. <laughs> In Paris? I feel that hardly points to any very serious state of mind at the last. You would no doubt wish me to make some slight allusion to this tragic domestic affliction next Sunday. Ooh. My sermon on the meaning of the manna in the wilderness can be adapted to any, any occasion, a joyful or, as in the present case, distressing. I have preached it at harvest celebrations, christenings, confirmations, on days of humiliation, and festal days. The last time I delivered it was in the cathedral as a charity sermon on behalf of the Society for the Prevention of the Discontent Among the Upper Orders. The bishop, who was present, was much struck by some of the analogies I drew. Ah, that reminds me. You mentioned christenings, I think, Dr. Chesuble. I suppose you know how to christen all right? I mean, of course, you are continually christening, aren't you? It is, I regret to say, one of the rector's most constant duties in this parish. I have often spoken to the poorer classes on the subject, but they don't seem to know what thrift is. But is there any particular infant in whom you are interested, Mr. Worthing? Your brother was, I believe, unmarried, was he not? Oh, yes. People who live entirely for pleasure usually are. But it is not for any child, dear doctor. I am very fond of children. <laughs> no, the fact is that I would like to be christened myself this afternoon, if you have nothing better to do. But surely, Mr. Worthing, you have been christened already. I don't remember anything about it. But have you any grave doubts on the subject? I certainly intend to have. Of course, I don't know if the thing would be, would bother you in any way, or if you think I am little too old. Not at all. Uh, the sprinkling and indeed the immersion of adults is a perfectly canonical practice. Immersion? Uh, you have no need for apprehension. Sprinkling is all that is necessary, or indeed I think advisable. Our weather is so changeable. Mm. Uh, at what hour would you wish the ceremony performed? Oh, I might trot round about five if that would suit you. Perfectly. Perfectly. In fact, I have two similar ceremonies to perform at that time. A case of twins that occurred recently in one of the outlying cottages of your own estate. Poor Jenkins the Carter. A most hard-working man. Oh, I don't see that there'd be much fun in being christened along with other babies. It would be childish. Uh, would half past five do? Admiral. Admirably. And now, uh, dear Mr. Worthing, I will not intrude any longer into a house of sorrow. I would merely beg you not to be too much bowed down by grief. Mm. What seem to us bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. This seems to be a blessing of an extremely obvious kind. Miss Cardew alights from the house. Jack! Oh, I am pleased to see you back. But what horrid clothes you have got on. Do go and change them. Oh, Cecily! My child, my child. What is the matter, Uncle Jack? Do you look happy? You look as if you had toothache, and I've got such a surprise for you. Who do you think is in the dining room? <laughs> Your brother! Who? Your brother Ernest! What? 
He arrived about half an hour ago. What the? I haven't got a brother. Oh, don't say that. However badly he may have behaved to you in the past, he's still your brother. You couldn't be so heartless as to disown him. I'll tell him to come out, and you will shake hands with him, won't you, Uncle Jack? Uh, Miss Cardew runs, May skips jubilantly back into the house. These are very joyful tidings. <laughs> um, after we had all been resigned to his loss, his sudden return seems to me peculiarly distressing. A brother in the dining room, I don't know what it all means. This is perfectly absurd. Miss Cardew returns to the garden, gleefully clutching a freshly refreshed Mr. Moncrief. Good heavens! Brother John, I have come down from town to tell you that I am very sorry for all the trouble I have given you and that I intend to lead a better life in the future. Uncle Jake, you are not going to refuse your own brother's hand. Nothing will induce me to take his hand. I think it's coming down here disgraceful, and he knows perfectly well why. Uncle Jack, do be nice. There is some good in everyone. Ernest, he's just been telling me about his poor invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, whom he goes to visit so often. And surely there must be much good in one who is kind to an invalid and leaves the pleasures of London to sit by a bed of pain. Oh, he's been talking about Bunbury, has he? Yes, he has told me all about poor Mr. Bunbury and his terrible state of health. Bunbury. Well, I won't have him. I won't have him talk to you about Bunbury or anything else. It is enough to drive one perfectly frantic. Of course, I admit that the thoughts were all on my side, <laughs> but I must say that I think that Brother John's coldness to me is peculiarly painful. I expected a more enthusiastic welcome, especially considering it is the first time I have come here. Uncle Jack, if you don't shake hands with Ernest, I will never forgive you. Never for... Uh, mm -hmm. Never forgive me? Never, never, never. Well, it's the last time I will ever do it. It is pleasant, is it not, to see so perfect a reconciliation? I think we might leave the two brothers together. Cecily, you will come with us. Certainly, Miss Prism. My little task of reconciliation is over. You have done a beautiful action today, dear child. Oh, we must not be premature in our judgments. I feel very happy. All the rest depart, leaving the dour Mr. Worthing and the beautiful Mr. Moncrief. You young scoundrel, Elsie! You must get out of this place at once! I don't want any bunburying here! Uh, Merriman approaches, looking positively knackered. I've put Mr. Ernest! Ah, things in the room next to your own, sir. I suppose that is all right. What? Mr. Ernest. <laughs> ah, luggage, sir. I've unpacked it and put it into the room next to your own. It's luggage. Oh, yes, sir. Three portmanteaus, a dressing case, two hat boxes, and a large luncheon basket. Um, I'm afraid I can't stay more than a week this time. Merriman, order the dog cart at once. Mr. Ernest has been suddenly called back to town. Yes, sir. Uh, why is it always up the stairs and downstairs? Merriman departs slowly with great effort and exertion. What a fearful liar you are, Jack. I have not been called back to town at all. You two have. I haven't had anyone call me. Your duty as a gentleman calls you back. My duty as a gentleman has mm -hmm. never interfered with my pleasures in the smallest degree. I can quite understand that. <laughs> well, Cecily is a darling. You are not to talk of Miss Cardew like that. I don't like it. Well, I don't like your clothes. You look perfectly <gasps> ridiculous in them. Why on earth don't you go up and change? It is perfectly childish to be in deep mourning for a man who's actually staying for a whole week with you in your house. 
as a guest. Oh. I call it grotesque. You are certainly not staying with me for a whole week as a guest or anything else. You have got to leave by the 4-5 train. Yeah, I certainly won't leave you so long as you're in mourning. Oh it would be most unfriendly. If I were in mourning, you would stay with me, I suppose. I, I should think it very unkind if you didn't. Well, will you go if I change my clothes? Mm, yes. <sighs> if you are not too long. I never saw anybody take so long to dress in with such little result. At any rate, that is better than being always overdressed as you are. Well, if I'm occasionally a little overdressed, I, I make up for it by being always immensely overeducated. Your vanity is ridiculous, your conduct an outrage, and your presence in my garden absolutely absurd. However, you've got to catch the 4 or 5, and <laughs> I hope you have a pleasant journey back to town. This bunburying, as you call it, <laughs> hasn't been a great success for you. And with that thoroughly offensive conduct towards my most beloved master, the disgraceful Mr. Worthing goes into the house. I think it has been a great success. I'm in love with Cecily and that is everything. So I must see her before I go and, and make arrangements for another Bunbury. Miss Cardew slips back into the garden, adopting the pretense of hydrating her rose bush. Ah, oh, uh, there she is. Oh, I merely came back to water the roses. I thought you were with Uncle Jack. He's gone to order the dog cart for me. Oh, is he going to take you for a nice drive? But he's going to send me away. Then have we got to part? I'm afraid so. It's a very painful parting. It is always painful to part from people whom one has known for a very brief space of time. Mm. The absence of old friends one can endure with equanimity, but even a momentary separation from anyone to whom one has just been introduced is almost unbearable. Thank you. Merriman enters. I wonder if someone should find him a chair. The dog cart is at the door, sir. You can wait, Merriman, for five minutes. It's, it's, it's going to take me five minutes just to get in the first place. Merriman minutes. struggles up the front steps. Looking rather worse for wear, old boy. <sighs> I hope, Cecily, I shall not offend you if I state quite frankly and openly that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection. I think your frankness does you great credit, Ernest. If you will allow me, I would like to copy your remarks into my diary. Oh, do you really keep a diary? I'd, yeah, I'd give anything to look at it. Uh, may I? Oh, no. Uh, no. You see, it is, simply a sim it is simply a very young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions, and consequently meant for publication. When it appears in volume form, I hope you will order a copy. But pray, Ernest, don't stop. I delight in taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection. Ah. You can go on, I am quite ready for more. <clears throat> oh, don't cough, Ernest. When one is dictating, one should speak fluently and not cough. Besides, I don't know how to spell a cough. Cecily, ever since I have first looked upon your wonderful and incomparable beauty, I have dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. I don't think you should tell me that you love me wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Hopelessly doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Cecily. Clutching to his last threads of life, Merriman emerges from the house. The dark God is waiting, sir. Jesus, uh, tell him to come round next week at the same hour. <laughs> Merriman retires into the house. Maybe he should make it permanent. Uncle Jack would be very much annoyed if he knew you were staying on till next week at the same hour. No, I don't care about 
Jack. I don't care for anybody in the whole world but you. I love you, Cecily. You will marry me, won't you? You silly boy, of course. <laughs> Why, we have been engaged for the last three months. For the last three months? Yes, it will be exactly three months on Thursday. But, but how, how did we become engaged? Well, ever since dear Uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother who was very wicked in bed, you, of course, have formed the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prism. And, of course, a man who is much talked about is always very attractive. One feels there must be something in him, after all. I dare say it was foolish of me, but... I fell in love with you, Ernest. Oh, darling. Oh. And uh, when was the engagement actually settled? On the 14th of February last. Worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I determined to end the matter one way or the other. And after a long struggle with myself, I accepted you under this dear old tree here. The next day, I bought this little ring in your name, and this is the little bangle with the true lover's knot I promised you always to wear. Ah, did I give you this? Uh, hmm, it's very pretty, isn't it? <laughs> yes, you've a wonderfully good taste, Ernest. <laughs> Thank you. It's the excuse I've always given for your leading such a bad life. And this is the box in which I keep all your dear letters. Oh, my letters? <laughs> but my own sweet little Cecily, I, I have never written you any letters. You need hardly remind me of that, Ernest. I wrote you, I remember only too well that I was forced to write your letters for you. I wrote you always three times a week and sometimes oftener. Oh, do let me read them, Cecily. Oh, I couldn't possibly. They would make you far too conceited. The three you wrote me after I had broken off the engagement are so beautiful and so badly spelled that even now I can hardly read them without crying a little. But was our engagement ever broken off? Of course it was, on the 22nd of last March. Oh, you can see the entry if you like. Ah. Today I broke off my engagement with Ernest. <clears throat> I feel it is better to do so. The weather still continues charming. Uh, but why on earth did you break it off? Uh, what had I done? I, I had done nothing at all. Cecily, I am very much hurt indeed to hear you broke it off, particularly when the weather was so charming. It would hardly have been a really serious engagement if it hadn't been broken off at least once. <laughs> but I forgave you before the week was out. Mm, what a perfect angel you are, Cecily. You dear romantic boy. Mm -hmm. I hope your hair curls naturally, does it? Oh, yes, darling. With a little help from others. I am so glad. You'll never break off our engagement again, Cecily. I don't think I could break it off now that I've actually met you. Besides, of course, there is the question of your name. Yes, of course. You must not laugh at me, darling, but it had always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone whose name was Ernest. There's something in that name that seems to inspire absolute confidence. I pity any poor married woman whose husband is not called Ernest. <laughs> mm. But my dear child, do you mean to say that you could not love me if I had some other name? But what name? Oh, th th any name you like. <laughs> Algernon, for instance. But I don't like the name of Algernon. Well, my own dear, sweet, loving, little darling, I, I really can't see why you should object to the name of Algernon. It's not at all a bad name. In fact, it is rather an aristocratic name. Half of the chaps who get into the bankruptcy court are called Algernon. Yeah, but seriously, Cecily, if my name was Algy, couldn't you love me? I might respect you, Ernest. Okay. I might admire your character, but I fear that I should not be able to give you my 
undivided attention. <laughs> Certainly. Oh. Your rector here is, I suppose, thoroughly experienced in the practice of all the rites and ceremonials of the church. Oh, yes. Dr. Chastable is a most learned man. He's never written a single book, so you can imagine how much he knows. I must see him at once on a most important christening. I, I mean, a, a most important business. Oh. I, I shan't be away for more than half an hour. Considering that we have been engaged since February the 14th, and that I only met you today for the first time, I think it is rather hard that you should leave me for so long a period as half an hour. Couldn't you make it 20 minutes? I'll be back in no time. Mr. Moncrief rushes down the garden, leaving behind a puzzled Miss Cardew. What an impetuous boy he is. I like his hair so much. Well, I must into his proposal in my diary. Merriman enters most excitedly. He's caught a second wind. Fairfax has just called to see Mr. Worthing on very important business, Miss Fairfax states. Isn't Mr. Worthing in his library? Mr. Worthing went over in the direction of the rectory some time ago. Pray ask the lady to come out here. Mr. Worthing is sure to be back soon, and, and you can bring tea. Yes, me, so tea, finally! Mm. A merriment departs, looking the most alive he's been in weeks. Miss Fairfax, I suppose one of the many good elderly women who are associated with Uncle Jack in some of his philanthropic work in London. I don't quite like women who are interested in philanthropic work. I think it is so forward of them. Merriman enters all a Twitter. Miss Fairfax! Miss Fairfax, breathless with anticipation, sweeps into the garden, shoving Merriman out. Pray let me introduce myself to you. My name is Cecily Cardew. Cecily Cardew. Oh, what a very sweet name. Something tells me we are going to be great friends. I like you already more than I can say. My first impressions of people are never wrong. How nice of you to like me so much after we have known each other such a comparatively short time. Pray sit down. Miss Fairfax pointedly ignores this request. I may call you Cecily, may I not? With pleasure. And you will always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? If you wish. Then it is all quite settled, is it not? I hope so. After a most pregnant pause, both ladies sit. <sighs> Perhaps this is a favourable opportunity of my mentioning who I am. My father is Lord Bracknell. You have never heard of Papa, I suppose. I don't think so. Outside the family circle, Papa, I'm glad to say, is entirely unknown. I think it is quite as it should be. The home seems to me to be the proper sphere for a man. And certainly, once a man begins to neglect his domestic duties, he becomes painfully effeminate, does he not? And I don't like that. It makes a man so very attractive. <laughs> oh, Cecily. Mama, whose views on education are remarkably strict, has brought me up to be extremely short-sighted. It is part of her system. So you don't mind my looking at you through my glasses? Oh, not at all, Gwendolyn. I am very fond of being looked at. Oh. You are here on a short visit, I suppose? Oh, no, I live here. Really? Your mother, no doubt, or female relative of advanced years resides here also? Oh, no. I have no mother, nor in fact any relations. Oh, indeed. My dear guardian, with the assistance of Miss Prism, has the arduous task of looking after me. Your guardian? Yes, I am Mr. Worthing's ward. Oh, I, it is strange. He never mentioned to me he had a ward. How secretive of him. He grows more interesting hourly. I, I am not sure, however, that the news inspires me with uh, feelings of unmixed delight. I am fond of you, Cecily. I have liked you ever since I met you. But I am bound to state that now that I know that you are 
Mr. Worthing's ward, I cannot help expressing a wish that you were, well, just a little bit older than you seem to be, and not quite so very alluring in appearance. Uh, in fact, if I may speak candidly... Oh, pray do. I think that whenever one has anything unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. Well, to speak with perfect candor, Cecily, I wish that you were fully 42, and more than unusually plain for your age. <laughs> Ernest has a strong, upright nature. He is the very soul of truth and honor. A disloyalty would be as impossible to him as deception. Oh, but even men of the noblest possible moral character are extremely susceptible to the influence of the physical charms of others. Modern and no less ancient history supplies us with the most painful examples of what I refer to. If it were not so, indeed, history would be quite unreadable. Pardon, Gwendolyn. Did you say Ernest? Yes. Oh, but it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. It is his brother, his elder brother. Ernest never mentioned to me he had a brother. I am sorry to say they have not been on good terms for a long time. Ah, that counts for it. I doubt that I think of it. I have never heard any man mention his brother. Ah, oh, the subject seems distasteful to most men. Oh, Cecily, you have lifted a load from my mind. I was growing almost anxious. It would be terrible if any cloud had come across a friendship like ours, would it not? Uh, of course, um, you are quite, quite sure that it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian? Quite sure. In fact, I am going to be his. I beg your pardon? Dearest Gwendolyn, there is no reason why I should make a secret of it to you. A little county newspaper is sure to chronicle the fact next week. Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. Fairfax rises quite politely, the tension rising with her. My darling Cecily, I think there is some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the Morning Post on Saturday at the latest. Miss Cardew follows suit, rising even more politely than Miss Fairfax, bringing the tension to a boil. I am afraid you must be under some misconception. Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. It's right here. It's the post. Oh, uh, it is rather curious, uh, for he asked me to be his wife yesterday afternoon at ah, 5.30. If you would like to verify the incident, pray do so. Uh, I never go anywhere without my diary. One can always have something sensational to read on a train. I am so sorry, dear Cecily, if it is of any disappointment to you. But I am afraid I have the prior claim. It would distress me more than I can tell you, dear Gwendolyn, if it caused you any mental or physical anguish. But I feel bound to point out that since Ernest proposed to you, he clearly has changed his mind. If the poor fellow has been entrapped into any foolish promise, I shall consider it my duty to rescue him, and with a firm hand. Whatever unfortunate entanglement my dear boy may have got into, I will never reproach him with it after we are married. Do you allude to me, Miss Cardew, as an entanglement? You are presumptuous. On the occasion of this kind, it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind. It becomes a pleasure. Do you suggest, Miss Fairfax, that I entrapped Ernest into an engagement? 
How dare you? On, there is, this is no time for wearing the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. I am glad to say I have never seen a spade. It is obvious that our social spheres are widely different. Merriman enters, breaking the heat of the moment with a presentation of afternoon tea. The presence of the feeble butler exercises a restraining influence under which both girls chafe. Well, I lay tea here, as usual, miss. Yes, as usual. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Merriman begins to arrange the tea with all the grace, as usual, of an arthritic sloth. I will read this. There are many interesting walks in the vicinity, Miss Cardew. Oh, yes, a great many. From the top of one of the hills quite close, one can see five counties. Five counties? <gasps> Ugh, I don't think I should like that. I hate crowds. I suppose that is why you live in town. Quite a well-kept garden this is, Miss Cardew. So glad you like it, Miss Fairfax. I had no idea there were so many flowers in the country. Oh, flowers are as common here, Miss Fairfax, as people are in London. Personally, I cannot understand how anyone seems to exist in the country. If anyone, who is anyone, does. The country always bores me to death. Ah, this is what the newspapers call agricultural depression, is it not? I believe the aristocracy are suffering very much from it just at present. It is almost an epidemic amongst them, I have been told. May I offer you some tea, Miss Fairfax? <laughs> Thank you. Detestable girl. Oh, but I require tea. Sugar? Oh, no, thank you. Sugar is not fashionable anymore. Merriman? Yes. <laughs> okay. Cake or bread and butter? Uh, bread and butter. Uh, thank you. Uh, cake is rarely seen in the best houses nowadays. Hand that, Miss Fairfax. Threatening to buckle under the weight of the pastry, Merriman manages to pass it to Miss Fairfax. <laughs> oh, I, I got it, I got it, I got it and then staggers out of the room, leaving behind him tensions thicker than the aforementioned cake. Miss Fairfax rises in indignation. You have filled my tea with lumps of sugar, and though I most distinctly asked for bread and butter, you have given me cake. I am known for the gentleness of my disposition and the extraordinary sweetness of my nature, but I warn you, Miss Cardew, you may go too far. Angelic Miss Cardew, more affronted, likewise rises. To save my poor, innocent, trusting boy from the machinations of any other girl, there are no links to which I would not go. From the moment I saw you, I distrusted you. I felt that you were false and deceitful, and I am never deceived on such matters. My first impressions of people are invariably right. It seems to me, Miss Fairfax, that I am trespassing on your valuable time. No doubt you have many other calls of a similar character to make in the neighborhood. Uh, Mr. Worthing enters with lusty vigor, having been notified of Miss Fairfax's arrival. Oh, Ernest. Mm. My own Ernest. Uh, Gwendolyn, darling. A moment. May I ask you if you are engaged to be married to this young lady? <laughs> Dear Cecily, of course not. What would have put such an idea in your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. Mm. Mm. I knew 
knew there must be some misunderstanding, Miss Fairfax. The gentleman whose arm is at present round your waist is my guardian, Mr. John Worthing. <coughs> I beg your pardon? This is Uncle Jack. <laughs> Oh! Well, Mr. Moncrief enters with eyes only for Miss Cardew. Here is Ernest. My own love. A moment, Ernest. May I ask you, are you engaged to be married to this young lady? To what young lady? Ah, good heavens, Gwendolyn. Yes, to good heavens, Gwendolyn. I, I mean to Gwendolyn. Of course not. What could have put such an idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. I felt there was some slight error, Miss Cardew. The gentleman who is now embracing you is my cousin, Mr. Algernon Moncrief. Algernon Moncrief? Oh! Are you called Algernon? Ch I cannot deny it. Oh. Is your name really John? I can deny it if I like. I could deny anything if I like. But my name is certainly John. Oh. It has been John for years. A gross deception has been practiced on both of us. My Poor wounded Cecily. My sweet wronged Gwendolyn. You will call me sister, will you not? <laughs> oh. The ladies embrace in their newfound camaraderie. The gentlemen groan at the fulfillment of their earlier prophecy. And it's just one question I would like to be allowed to ask my guardian. An admirable idea. Mr. Worthing, there is just one question I would like to be permitted to put to you. Where is your brother, Ernest? <sighs> we are both engaged to your brother, Ernest. <clears throat> so it is a matter of some importance to know where your brother, Ernest, is at present. <sighs> Gwendolyn, Cecily, it's very painful for me to be forced to speak the truth. It is, in fact, the first time in my life I have ever been reduced to such a painful position. And I am really quite inexperienced in doing anything of the kind. However, I will tell you quite frankly that I have no brother, Ernest. I have no brother at all. In fact, um, I've never had a brother in my life, and I certainly haven't the smallest intention of ever having one in the future. No brother at all? None! Had you never a brother of any kind? Never! Not of any kind! Weird, right? I'm afraid it is quite clear, Cecily, that neither of us are engaged to be married to anyone. It is not a pleasant position for a young girl suddenly to find herself in, is it? Let us go into the house. They will hardly venture to come after us there. No, men are so cowardly, aren't they? The two ladies retire into the house, a unified front of sisterhood. It's the world! Girls! Yes. Ghastly state of things is what you call bunburying, I suppose. Yes, and a perfectly wonderful bunbury it is. The most wonderful bunbury I've ever had in my life. You have no right whatsoever to bunbury here. Oh, that's absurd. One has the right to Bunbury anywhere one chooses. Every serious Bunbury knows that. Serious? But good heavens, man! Well, one must be serious about something if one wants to have any amusement in life. I happen to be serious about Bunbury. What on earth you are serious about? I haven't got the remotest idea. About everything, I should fancy. You have an absolutely trivial nature. Well. The only small satisfaction I have in this whole wretched business is that your friend Bunbury is quite exploded. You won't be able to go run down to the country quite so often as you used to, dear Elgie. A very good thing, too. 
Your brother is a little off color, isn't he, dear Jack? You won't be able to disappear to London quite so frequently as your wicked custom was, and not a bad thing either. And as for your conduct towards Miss Cardio, well, Miss Cardio, I must say that you're taking in a sweet, simple, innocent girl like that is quite inexcusable to say nothing of the fact that she is my ward. I can see no possible defense at all for your deceiving a brilliant, clever, thoroughly experienced young lady like Miss Fairfax to say nothing of the fact that she is my cousin. I wanted to be engaged to Gwendolyn. That is all. I love her. Well, I simply wanted to be engaged to Cecily. I adore her. There is certainly no chance of you marrying Miss Cardio. I don't think there is much likelihood, Jack, of you and Miss Fairfax being united. Well, that is no business of yours. If it was my business, I wouldn't talk about it. It is very vulgar to talk about one's business. Only people like stockbrokers do that, and then merely only at dinner parties. How can you sit there, oh, calmly eating muffins, while we are in this terrible trouble? I can't make out. Mm. You seem to be perfectly heartless. Well, I can't eat muffins in an agitated manner. The butter probably gets on my cuffs. Mm. One should always eat muffins quite calmly. This is the only way to eat them. I say it's perfectly heartless you're oh. eating muffins at all under the circumstance. Uh-uh. When I'm in trouble, eating is the only thing that consoles me. Indeed, when I'm in really great trouble, as anyone who knows me intimately will tell you, I refuse everything except food and drink. At the present moment, I'm eating muffins because I am unhappy. Besides, I am, I am particularly fond of muffins. Well, there's no reason oh. to eat them all in such a greedy way. Oh! I wish you would have the tea cake instead. I, I don't like tea cake. Well, it's good here. I suppose a man may eat his own muffins in his own garden. But you have just said it was perfectly heartless to eat muffins. I said it was perfectly heartless of you under the circumstance. This is a very different thing. That may be, but the muffins are the same. Uh-uh. Mm -hmm. LG, I wish to goodness you would go. You can't possibly ask me to go without having some dinner. <laughs> it's absurd. I never go without my dinner. No one ever does, ex except you know, vegetarians and people like that. Besides, mm, mm, I have just made arrangements with Dr. Chasuble to be christened at a quarter to six under the name of Ernest. My dear fellow, the <clears throat> sooner you give up that nonsense, the better. I've made arrangements this morning with Dr. Chasuble to be christened myself at 5 and 30. And I, naturally, will be taking the name of Ernest. Gwendolyn oh. We can't both be Ernest. <laughs> That's absurd. <laughs> Besides, I have a perfect right to be christened if I like. There's no evidence at all that I've been christened by anybody. I should think it prob very probable that I wasn't. And so does Dr. Chasuble. It's entirely different in your case. You've been christened already. Yes. But I haven't been christened for years. Yes, but you have been christened and that's the important thing. Quite so. So I know my constitution can stand it. Yeah. If you are not quite sure about your ever having been christened, I must say, I think it's rather dangerous you're venturing on it now. It might make you very unwell. You can hardly have forgotten that someone very closely connected with you was very nearly carried off this week in Paris by a severe chill. Yes, but you said yourself that the severe chill wasn't hereditary. Well, it used to be, I know. But I dare say it is now. You know, Science is always making wonderful improvements in things. That is nonsense. You're always talking nonsense. Jack! Ow! You are at the muffins again. Yeah. I wish you wouldn't. There are only two left. I told you, I was particularly fond of muffins. But I hate tea cakes! Why on earth do you allow tea cake to be served up for your guests? 
What idea do you have of hospitality? Algernon, I have told you to go. I don't want you here. Why don't you go? I haven't quite finished my tea yet. Oh, and there's still one muffin left. <laughs> oh, God. With mouths full of muffins and hearts full of despair, mm. our curtain drops and lights come up, metaphorically speaking, again. End of Act Two. <laughs> uh, well, our dear friends, you may be able to tell now who the uh, lightweights of the cast are, and All some right. of us are calling All right. it a little bit. Hey, I'm just, I'm calling myself out on that one. I had a whole act to drink before saying words. <laughs> Uh, we do have an absolutely delightful interlude for you while our cast refreshes beverages, maybe switches to water, maybe not. Maybe we'll just get real fun. Uh, but we do have another wonderful interlude for you. Um, since we are raising money for the uh, the new Broadway initiative of Broadway, uh, uh, Broadway for Racial Justice, um, a wonderful musical theater performer, Tao Nguyen, uh, has uh, sent us a few um, of uh, their performances. We're gonna start with one of my absolutely favorite songs, uh, I Am What I Am from La Cage a Folle, and that will be followed by Some Enchanted Evening. So uh, cast, go mute please. And uh, folks, I will, I will endeavor to get the tech working a little better this go round. Oh, by the way, please return it. Uh, 12 after the hour. We're going to go a little longer on this one.
I'll give an applause of one. <laughs> Thank you again so much to tell yeah, for sharing. Ooh, hang on. <laughs> Technical issues. There we go. Uh, <laughs> Thank you to YouTube for automatic commercials. Boy, do we appreciate you. Uh, all right, oh, all right, Gwendolyn's digging into the cake. I think our, all of our drinks are fresh. I don't know if the audience can tell. I am very warm. I will ask the actors before we get started on, uh, on act three. All right, what were the, the, uh, the muffins? I believe, uh, I believe Jack had marshmallows. Oh yeah, straight up marshmallows, yeah, the big ones. That's disgusting. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was the things I do for you people. We adore it. And uh, and what were yours also marshmallows? No, I had chocolate chip mini muffins. Oh. Mm. And honestly, save, saving my life currently. Gotta say. <laughs> Lucky mm. you. Mm. Yeah, I'm a little warm. All right, so with this, uh, this heat and continued uh, indulgence, at least on my end, I don't know about all the rest of you. Looks like Gwen is padding up with a little sobriety. Uh, let's roll back in. Here we are for act three of the importance of being and drinking in earnest. Thank you all for continuing to be with us. Uh, the morning room at the manor house. Miss Fairfax and Miss Cardew are at the window looking out into the garden where the gentlemen remain scoffing muffins. The fact that they do not follow us at once into the house as anyone else would have done seems to me to show that they have some sense of shame left. They have been eating muffins. That looks like repentance. They don't seem to notice us at all. Couldn't you cough? But they haven't got a cough. <gasps> they are looking at us. What a Frontery. Oh, they're approaching. Oh, that's very forward of them. Oh, let us preserve a dignified silence. Certainly. It's the only thing to do now. And to Mr. Worthing, followed by Mr. Moncrief, crowing some dreadful popular air with the same proficiency as Mr. Moncrief's earlier piano playing. I'm bringing muffins back. Yep. Yeah. That's why they call me an aristocrat. Yeah. This dignified silence seems to produce an unpleasant effect. A most distasteful one. But we will not be the first to speak. Certainly not. Mr. Worthing, I have something very particular to ask you. Much depends on your reply. Gwendolyn, your common sense is invaluable. Mr. Mm. Moncrief, kindly answer me the following question. Why did you pretend to be my guardian's brother? <laughs> In order that I might have an opportunity of meeting you. That certainly seems a satisfactory explanation, does it not? Yes, dear, if you can believe him. I don't, but that does not affect the wonderful beauty of his answer. True. In matters of grave importance, style, not sincerity is the vital thing. Hmm. Mr. Moncrief. Mr. Worthing, what explanation can you possibly offer for me for pretending to have a brother? Was it in order that you might have an opportunity of coming up to town to see me as often as possible? Can you doubt it, Miss Fairfax? I have the gravest doubts on the subject, but I intend to crush them. This is not a moment for German skepticism. Their explanations appear to be quite satisfactory, especially Mr. Worthing's. That seems to me to have the stamp of truth upon it. I am more than content with what Mr. Moncrief said. His voice alone inspires one with absolute credulity. Then you think we should forgive them? Yes. I mean, no. True. I had almost forgot. There are principles at stake that one cannot surrender. Which of us should tell them? task is not a pleasant one. Could we not both speak at the same time? An excellent idea. I nearly always speak at the same time as other people. Will you take your time from me? Certainly. <laughs> your your Christian names are still an insuperable barrier. Yeah. 
That is all. Our, Our Christian, Christian names is, is that all? But, but we, we are going to, to be, be christened, christened this afternoon. This afternoon. For my sake, you're prepared to do this terrible thing? I am. To please me, you are ready to face this fearful ordeal? I am. Oh, how absurd to talk of the equality of the sexes. Where questions of self-sacrifice are concerned, men are infinitely beyond us. We are. They have moments of physical courage of which we women know absolutely nothing. Darling. 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 Having reconciled their differences, the couples fall into passionate embraces. Lane, I find my heart strangely moved. Perhaps we should try some of this reconciliation ourselves? Um, uh, unsure if he's feeling the swell of romance or an impending heart attack. Merriman enters once more, strategically interrupting an awkward situation. Ahem, ahem. <laughs> Lady Bracknell! Good heavens! Lady Bracknell barrels in like a steam engine. The couples, hot and heavy for other reasons, separate in alarm. I make a hasty retreat. Gwendolyn, what does this mean? <clears throat> Merely that I'm engaged to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Come here. Sit down. Sit down immediately. Hesitation of any kind is a sign of mental decay in the young, of physical weakness in the old. Oh. A prize, sir, of my daughter's sudden flight by her trusty maid, whose confidence I purchased by means of a small coin. I followed her at once by a luggage train. Her unhappy father is, I am glad to say, under the impression that she is attending a more than usually lengthy lecture by the university extension scheme on the influence of a permanent income on thought. I do not propose to undeceive him. Indeed, I have never undeceived him on any question. I would consider it wrong. But of course, you will clearly understand that all communication between yourself and my daughter must cease immediately from this moment. On this point, as indeed on all points, I am firm. I am engaged to be married to Gwendolyn, Lady Bracknell. You are nothing of the kind, sir. And uh, as regards Algernon... Algernon? Yes, yes, Aunt Augusta. <clears throat> May I ask if it is in this house that your invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, resides? Oh, no, 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 no. Bunbury doesn't live here. <laughs> Bunbury is somewhere else at the moment. In fact, Bunbury is dead. Dead? Mm -hmm. When did Mr. Bunbury die? His mm -hmm. death must have been extremely sudden. No, I killed Bunbury this afternoon. I, I mean, poor Bunbury died this afternoon. What did he die of? Mm -hmm. uh, Bunbury? <laughs> no, he was quite exploded. Exploded? Was he the victim of a revolutionary outrage? I was not aware that Mr. Bunbury was interested in social legislation. If so, he is well punished for his morbidity. Uh, my dear Aunt Augusta, I, I mean he was found out. <laughs> The doctors found out that Bunbury could not live. That is what I mean. So, so Bunbury died. Yeah. He seems to have had great confidence in the opinion of his physicians. I am glad, however, that he made up his mind at the last to some definite course of action and acted mm. under proper medical advice. And now that we have finally got rid of this Mr. Bunbury, may I ask, Mr. Worthing, who is that young person whose hand my nephew Algernon is now holding in what seems to me a peculiarly unnecessary manner? That lady is Miss Cecily Cardew, my ward. Uh, I'm engaged to be married to Cecily, Aunt Augusta. I beg your pardon? Mr. Moncrief and I are engaged to be married, Lady Bracknell. 
I do not know whether there is anything peculiarly exciting in the air of this particular part of Hertfordshire, but the number of engagements that go on seems to me considerably above the proper average that statistics have laid down for our guidance. I think some preliminary inquiry on my part would not be out of place. Mr. Worthing, is Miss Cardew at all connected with any of the larger railway stations in London? I merely desire information. Until yesterday, I had no idea that there were any families or persons whose origin was a terminus. Miss Cardew is the granddaughter of the late Mr. Thomas Cardew of 149 Belgrave Square, SW, Gervais Park, Dorking, Surrey, and the Sporin, Fiefshire, NB. That sounds... Not unsatisfactory. Three addresses always inspire confidence, even in tradesmen. But what proof have I of their authenticity? I have carefully preserved the court guides of the period. They are open to your inspection, Lady Bracknell. Hmm. I have known strange errors in that publication. Miss Cardew's family solicitors are Messrs. Marksby, Markby, and Markby. Marksby, Markby, and Markby a firm of the very highest position in their profession. Indeed, I am told that one of the Mr. Markby's is occasionally to be seen at dinner parties. So far, I am satisfied. How extremely kind of you, Lady Bracknell. I also have in my possession, you will be pleased to hear, certificates of Miss Cardew's birth, baptism, whooping cough, registration, vaccination, confirmation, and the measles. Both the German and the English variety. Ah, a life crowded with incident, I see. Though perhaps somewhat too exciting for a young girl, I am not myself in favour of premature experiences. Gwendolen, the time approaches for our departure. We have not a moment to lose. As a matter of form, Mr. Worthing, I had better ask you if Miss Cardew has any little fortune. Oh, about 130,000 in the funds, that's all. Goodbye, Lady Bracknell. So pleased to have seen you. A moment, Mr. Worthing. 130,000 pounds. And in the funds. Miss Cardew seems to me a most attractive young lady now that I look at her. Few girls of the present day I have any really solid qualities any of the qualities that last and improve with time. We live, I regret to say, in an age of services. Come over here, dear. Pretty child. Your dress is sadly simple and your hair seems almost as if nature might have left it, but we can soon alter all that. A thoroughly experienced French maid produces a really marvelous result in a very brief space of time. I remember recommending one to young Lady Lansing, and after three months, her own husband did not recognize her. After six months, nobody knew her. Kindly turn around, dear child. No, no, the side view is what I want. Yes, quite as I expected. There are distinct social possibilities in your profile. The two weak points in our age are its want of principle and its want of profile. The chin a little higher, dear. Style largely depends on the way the chin is worn, and they are worn very high, just at present. Algernon? Uh, yes, Aunt Augusta. There are distinct social possibilities in Miss Cardew's profile. Cecily is the sweetest, dearest, prettiest girl in the whole world. And I don't care two pints about social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully of society, Algernon. Only people who can't get into it do that. <gasps> Dear child, of course you know that Algernon has nothing but his debts to depend upon. But well. I do not approve of mercenary marriages. When I married Lord Bracknell, I had no future fortune of any kind. But I never dreamed for a moment of allowing that to stand in my way. Well, I suppose I must give my consent. <sighs> Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Cecily, you may kiss me. Uh, thank you, Lady Bregnell. You may also address me as Aunt Augusta for the future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. The marriage, I think, had better take place quite soon. Oh, thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. To speak frankly, I am not in favour of long engagements. They give people the opportunity of finding out each other's character before marriage, and I think that's never advisable. 
I beg your pardon for interrupting you, Lady Bracknell, but this engagement is quite out of the question. I am Miss Cecily Cardew's guardian, and she cannot marry without my consent until she comes of age. That consent I absolutely decline to give. Upon what ground, may I ask? Algernon is an extremely, I may almost say, an ostentatiously eligible young man. He has nothing but he looks everything. What more can one desire? It pains me very much to leave, to speak so frankly with you, Lady Bracknell, about your nephew. But the fact is, is that I do not approve at all of his moral character. I, speaking, I suspect him of being untruthful. Untruthful? My nephew Algernon? Impossible. He is an Oxonian. Oh, I fear there can be no possible doubt about the matter. This afternoon, after my temporary absence in London on an important question of romance, he obtained admission to my house by means of false pretense under, of being my brother. Under an assumed name, he drank, I have been informed by my butler, an entire bottle of my Pierre Jouet Brut 89, wine I was specially reserving for myself. Continuing his disgraceful deception, he succeeded on the course of an afternoon of alienating the affections of my only ward. He subsequently stayed to tea, devoured every single muffin, and what makes his conduct all the more heartless, is that he was perfectly well aware that from the first that I have no brother, that I have never had a brother, and that I don't intend to have a brother, not even of any kind. I distinctly told him that myself yesterday afternoon. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, hmm? after careful consideration, I have decided, decided entirely to overlook my nephew's conduct to you. Oh. That is very generous of you, Lady Bracknell. My own decision, however, is unalterable. I decline to give my consent. Come here, sweet child. How old are you, dear? Well, I am really only eighteen, but I always admit to twenty when I go to evening parties. Evening par you are perfectly right in making some slight alteration. Indeed, no woman should ever be quite accurate about her age. It looks so calculating. 18, but admitting to 20 at evening parties. Well, it will not be very long before you are of age and free from the restraints of tutelage. So I don't think your guardian's consent is, after all, a matter of any importance. Hey, excuse me, uh, Lady Bracknell, for interrupting you again. But it is only fair to tell you that according to the terms of her grandfather's will, Miss Cardew does not come legally of age until she is 35. <laughs> that does not seem to me to be a grave objection. 35 is a very attractive age. London society is full of women of the very highest birth who have, of their own free choice, remained 35 for years. Lady Dumbleton is an instance in point. To my own knowledge, she's been 35 ever since she arrived at the age of 40, which has been many years ago now. I see no reason why our dear Cecily should not be even still more attractive at the age you mentioned than she is at present. There will be a large accumulation of property. Algie, could you wait for me till I was 35? Of course I could, Cecily. You know I could. Yes, I felt it instinctively. But I couldn't wait all that time. I hate waiting even five minutes for anybody. It always makes me rather cross. I am not punctual myself, I know, but I do like punctuality in others, and waiting, even to be married, is quite out of the question. Then what is to be done, Cecily? I don't know, Mr. Moncrief. My dear Mr. Worthing, as Miss Cardew states positively that she cannot wait until she is 35, a remark which I am bound to say seems to me to show a somewhat impatient nature. I would beg of you to reconsider your decision. But my dear Lady Bracknell, the matter is entirely in your own hands. The moment that you consent to my marriage with the lovely Gwendolen, I will most gladly allow your nephew to form an alliance with my ward. You must be quite aware that what you propose is out of the question. 
that a passionate celibacy is all that any of us can look forward to. That is not the destiny I propose for Gwendolyn. Algernon, of course, can choose for himself. Come, dear, we have already missed five, if not six, trains. To miss any more might expose us to comment on the platform. Dr. Chasuble strides into the room, breathless as always, and disrupts their departure with his sudden arrival. Everything is quite ready for the christenings. The christening, sir? Is that not somewhat premature? Uh, both of these gentlemen have expressed a desire for immediate baptism. At their age, the idea is grotesque and irreligious. Algernon, I forbid you to be baptized. I will not hear of such excesses. Lord Bracknell would be highly displeased if he learned that that was the way in which you wasted your time and money. Am I to understand that there will be no christenings this afternoon? I don't think that as things are now, it would be of much practical value to either of us, Dr. Chesuwell. I am grieved to hear such sentiments from you, Mr. Worthing. The savior of heretical views of the Anabaptists, views that I have completely refuted in four of my unpublished sermons. Uh, However, as your present mood seems to be one peculiarly secular, I will return to the church at once. Indeed, I have just been informed by the pew opener that for the last hour and a half, Miss Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. Miss Prism? Did, did I hear you mention a Miss Prism? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I am on my way to join her. Pray allow me to detain you for a moment. This matter may prove to be one of vital importance to Lord Bracknell and myself. Is this Miss Prism a female of repellent aspect, remotely connected with education? She is the most cultivated of ladies and the very picture of respectability. It is obviously the same person. May I ask what position she holds in your household? I am celibate, madam. Uh, Miss Prism, uh, Lady Bracknell, has been in uh, Ben for the last three years. Miss Carty is esteemed governess and valued companion. <laughs> In spite of what I hear of her, I must see her at once. Let her be sent for. She approaches. She is nigh! As if summoned by her cue, Miss Prism hurriedly appears, eyes drawn immediately to the rector. I was told you expected me in the vestry, dear Canon. I have been waiting for you there for an hour and three quarters. Oh, no! Prism! <laughs> Come here, Prism. Prism, where is that baby? Dun. 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 Twenty-eight years ago, Prism, you left Lord Bracknell's house, number 104, Upper Grosvenor Street, in charge of a perambulator that contained a baby of the male sex. You never returned. A few weeks later, through the elaborate investigations of the Metropolitan Police, the perambulator was discovered at midnight, standing by itself in a remote quarter, corner of Bayswater. It contained the manuscript of a three-volume novel of more than usually revolting sentimentality, but the baby was not there. Prism, where is that baby? Lady Bracknell, I admit with shame that I do not know. I only wish I did. The plain facts of the case are these. On the morning of the day you mention, a day that is forever branded on my memory, I prepared as usual to take the baby out in its perambulator. I had also with me a a somewhat old but capacious handbag in which I had intended to place the manuscript of a work of fiction that I had written during my few unoccupied hours. In a moment of mental abstraction for which I can never forgive myself, I deposited the manuscript in the bassinet and I put the baby in the handbag. But where did you deposit the handbag? Do not ask me, Mr. Worthy. Miss Prism. This is a matter of no small importance to me. I insist on knowing where you deposited the handbag that contained that infant. I left it in the cloakroom of one of the larger railway stations in London. What railway station? Victoria, the Brighton Line. 
I must retire to my room for a moment. Gwendolyn, you will wait here for me. If you are not too long, I will wait for you my entire life. <sighs> Mr. Worthing rushes out of the room in great excitement. And felt this much excitement in 20 odd years. <laughs> what do you think this means, Lady Bracknell? I dare not even suspect, Dr. Chasuble. I need hardly tell you that in families of high position, strange coincidences are not supposed to occur. They are hardly considered the thing. No, sir, I just cleaned out your room this morning. Whose are these? Oh, that's where I put them. I'll help you put it back in order later, Merriman. Oh, thank you. Uncle Jake seems strangely agitated. Your guardian has a very emotional nature. This noise is extremely unpleasant. It sounds as if he was having an argument. I dislike arguments of any kind. They are always vulgar and often convincing. It has stopped now. The noise of Mr. Worthing's feverish search is in fact redoubled. <laughs> so noisy. My and my excitement is redoubled as well. <laughs> I wish you would arrive at some conclusion. Mm. This suspense is terrible. Oh, I hope it will last. <laughs> is this your handbag, Miss Prism? Examine it carefully before you speak. The happiness of more than one life depends on your answer. Seems to be mine. Oh, yes. Here is the injury that it received during the upsetting of a Gower Street omnibus in younger and happier days. Oh, and here is the stain on the lining. Oh, it was from the explosion of a temperance beverage. <laughs> An incident that occurred at Leamington. And oh, here on the lock are my initials. I had forgotten that in an extravagant mood I had had them placed there. Oh, yes, the, the bag is undoubtedly mine. Oh, I'm so delighted to have it so unexpectedly restored to me. It has been a great inconvenience being without it all these years. <gasps> Miss Prism, more is restored to you than this handbag. Oh? I was the baby you placed in it. You? Yes. Mother. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, I am unmarried. Unmarried? Mm-hmm. Oh, I do not deny that this is a serious blow. But after all, who has the right to cast stones against one who has suffered? Can't repentance wipe out an act of folly? Why should there be one law for men and another for women? Mother, I forgive you. No, 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 Mr. Worthing. There is some error. Uh, there, there is the woman who can tell you who you really are. <sighs> Lady Bracknell, I hate to seem acquisitive. Could you kindly inform me who I am? Really, the news I have to give you will not altogether please you. You are the son of my poor sister, Mrs. Moncrief, and consequently, Algernon's elder brother. Elgie's elder brother? Then I have a brother after all. I knew I had a brother. I always said I had a brother. Cecily, how could you have ever doubted that I had a brother? <laughs> Dr. Chasuble, my unfortunate brother. Hello. Mr. Prism, my unfortunate brother. Good to see you, hello. Gwendolyn, my unfortunate brother. <laughs> Mucho gusto. Yes, sir. Cowdrell, you will have to treat me with more respect in the future. You have never behaved to me like a brother in all your life. Well, not till today, old boy, I admit. I, I did my best, however, though, I was out of practice. <laughs> My own. <sighs> but what own are you? 
what is your Christian name now that you become someone else? Good heavens. I had quite forgotten that point. Your decision on the subject of my name is irrev ir irrevocable, I suppose. Oh, I never change, except in my affections. What a noble nature you have, Gwendolyn. And the question had better be cleared at once. On to Gosta, a moment. At the time when Miss Prism left me in the handbag, had I been christened already? Every luxury that money could buy, including christening, had been lavished on you by your fond and doting parents. Then I was christened. That is settled. Now, what name was I given? Let me know the worst. Well, being the eldest, you were naturally christened after your father. Yes, but what was my father's Christian name? I cannot, at the present moment, recall what the general's Christian name was. You've got to be kidding me. But I have no doubt that he had one. He was eccentric, I admit, but only in later years, and that was the result of the Indian climate, and marriage, and indigestion, and other things of that kind. Elgie, you, can't you recall what our father's Christian name was? My dear boy, we were never even on speaking terms. He, he died before I was a year old. <sighs> His name would appear in the army lists of the period, I suppose, Aunt Augusta. The general was essentially a man of peace, except in his domestic life. But oh. I have no doubt his name would appear in any military directory. The military last, lists of the last 40 years. This delightful record should have been my constant study. Let's see here. M. General. Mm. Here we are. Malium, Max B, Angsley, ghastly names they have. Mark B, Mark B, Mar Moncrief, Lieutenant 1840, Captain, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, General. 1869. Christian names. Ernest John. I always told you, Gwendolyn, that my name was Ernest, didn't I? <laughs> well, it is Ernest, after all. Oh, God. I mean, naturally, it is Ernest. Ernest, right? Oh. Jesus. Yes, I remember now. The general was called oh, Ernest. <laughs> I knew I had some particular reason for disliking his name. Me too. Ernest. Fuck. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm sorry. My own Ernest. Oh, who wrote this? I felt from the first that you could have no other name but Ernest! Mm. <laughs> Gwendolyn, it is a terrible thing to find out that suddenly that all his life he's been t speaking nothing but the truth or some words like that. Can you forgive me? Oh, I can. <sighs> well, I fear you are sure to change. I own one. Letitia! Frederick, at last! Yeah. Algernon! Certainly, at last. <laughs> Ernest! <laughs> oh. oh, God. <laughs> that hard. Gwendolyn, at last, Ernest! <laughs> <laughs> Marcel! Blade, at last! My nephew, you seem to be displaying signs of triviality. On the contrary, Aunt Augusta. I've now realized for the first time in my life the vital importance of being earnest. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, I forgot to add ice. <laughs> <laughs> Quite neat. Oh. 
Well, dear friends, dear mm -hmm. audience, uh, everyone who tuned in tonight, we cannot say thank you enough for doing so. We hope and I don't know if we, I was about to say, we hope you're as snackered as we are. I don't know if we hope that. <laughs> <laughs> You couldn't tell, we're having a right good time up here. I do have a few things we'd like to say as the close of this. Um, first of all, my personal thanks to this entire wonderful cast. There are little hand emojis you can send. I will applaud them myself personally. Um, this is an absolutely wonderful bunch of people and I very much appreciate them jumping in on this of our first technological endeavor into the wonderful world of theater. Uh, I so appreciate it. Uh, especially huge thanks to the one person you didn't hear from except for one word tonight, and that is our cast swing, Anthony. Hey! Thank really. you for reading diligently the entire <sighs> show. The work, the work that he has done, none of you have seen, but in rehearsals when cast members couldn't be here, he popped in, he learned all the parts, and he literally was having to pay attention to the entire script should any of us fail while drinking, he was gonna pop in to save our bacon. So he has all of our thanks. He's absolutely incredible. Absolutely um, did more work than any of us. <laughs> so much more. Thank you. <laughs> so we so appreciate him. Um, thanks again to Tao and Ryan for providing our interludes during the intermission. We hope y'all watched them um, and enjoyed them. Thanks again to The Show Must Go Online, which was um, very much my personal inspiration and what I was drawing a lot of cues of how to do this art form from. If you're looking for good theater, they are doing one of Shakespeare's plays every single week. They started literally the day the, the day I stopped working for because of quarantine, they had a show up the next day. They have been doing this since the beginning. They're wonderful. If you want good theater while in quarantine, please seek them out. And thanks of course, to yeah. thank you to our wonderful audience. Yes! Thank you for joining us. I know several of you have been commenting and it has been uh, quite amusing to read your comments during the intermissions. Thank you so much for being uh, a very active participant in our production for us. Yes, thank you so much. And again, just a reminder, um, in lieu of any personal um, benefit, we, we really want to encourage you to go out and support Broadway for Racial Justice, trying to um, make, make positive movements in, the, in um, the theater community, which we are all a part of in one way or another. Um, I, I saw a comment from someone very graciously asking, how do you support us as well as them? With your dollars, please support them. Whatever dollars you have, please send to that cause. If you wanna support us individually, um, our, our, our names, our credits are all over our social media. You can seek us all out individually. Um, as, a, as a company, we would, we would absolutely love if you stick around, stay a fan on our social media pages, spread this play to other people. Um, it's gonna stay on YouTube. So if folks weren't able to tune in tonight, spread it around. Um, and we have so much more to come. We are just starting yeah. out as a company and we hope to do more virtual shows as well as shows live once we are able to. So please, you know, follow us and uh, keep your ears and eyes open for more productions to come soon in the future. Yeah, I'm seeing, I'm seeing one comment and I'm going to give a given up to it. Uh, J.E. saying every member should bow so that we can clap and thank. So um I don't know how to do, I'll do this in reverse on the Zoom, uh, even though it has nothing to do with how much anyone did of work-wise, we'll just go reverse. So um, Adam Plant as Lane. Uh, and then we have Jake Daly as Merriman. Our cast swing, Anthony Hansen. Myself, Sarah Dernesque, Miss Prism. Uh, then next we have, uh, Dylan, um, oh my gosh, I'm drunk and I can't think of your last name. Is it Collins? Collins. Yeah, oh my God, I was right. <laughs> Dylan Collins as Canon Chasuble. <laughs> then we have uh, Danny uh, Burke as Lady Bracknell. Woo! Followed Love by that. Danny Carr as Cecily Cardew. Then uh, uh, Trevor, uh-huh. <laughs> Martin, Martin, Trevor Martin. Martin. <laughs> Algernon Moncrief, uh, <laughs> James Freer as Jack Worthing, and last but certainly not least, my fellow co-producer Ariel Dement as Gwendolyn Fairfax. Merci. Oh, wow. All right. So y'all, again, you can tell who the lightweight in the cast is. It me. <laughs> y'all, whatever indulgence there's or punishment no you chose, we hope you've had fun. Um, <laughs> cast, if there's anything you want to say, please feel free. If you guys have any ideas about shows that you would like to see, leave it in the comments. Yes, please. 
We are constantly looking for new stuff to do and uh, we are definitely looking for our next production. So we will be hopefully having something up in the next few weeks for you as a new production that you can watch live. And who knows, maybe in the future, something you know live that you can actually go to. So the, the plan, just, just to let you all a little sneak peek since you've stayed with us through the whole show, the plan of what Ariel and I were hoping to do was, was live theater that we could stream. Um, as content as well. So that's kind of the goal is a, is a combination of, of, of live and um, I guess global through, through streaming powers, um, a sense of com um, community as, as wide as we can reach it. So again, we thank you all. We thank our cast. Um, can't say enough. So thank you all. Cast, anything yeah. else? Just thank you for coming. Thank, thank you, so, you much. so much. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you for drinking a lot of water now. Oh. We have everyone from all over the country. So we're East Coast and West Coast. So it's eight. It's, yeah, no. It sure it's, is. It's it is 11. <laughs> Sun isn't down yet, y'all. Oh, no. It's 11, ma'am. It is 11 o'clock. <laughs> it's oh, where I am. A little well, it's bit eight. That means. <laughs> There's time for more drinking. Yeah. All right. Oh, so yeah. um, I think we'll stop After the party. live stream. The Zoom prep call might keep going. <laughs> Audience, thank you so much. We very much appreciate you. Please support Broadway for Racial Justice and uh, support the arts wherever you find them. Arts and artists are uh, are very critical right now. Thank y'all. Thank you. Thank we love you. you so much. Thank you.